My name is Madison Fernandez, and I'm the current editor-in-chief of the University of St. Thomas Law Journal. Um, I am very happy to see everyone here today, and I really appreciate everyone showing up to see these wonderful panelists on this first panel, as well as our second panel that will happen after the break later this morning. Um, as you can see, we have gone ahead and done the agenda and the event program um, on this QR code this morning. So if you want to take your phones out and scan this so you can get a short bio for all of our speakers this morning. That is where it is available. Otherwise, I will turn it over right away to Dean Vischer to give our introduction. Thank you. Thank you, Madison. Uh, welcome to the University of St. Thomas Law Journal's Editor-in-Chief Lecture on the Power of the Pardon. I'm grateful to Madison and all the student editors who have worked hard putting this together, as well as their faculty advisor, Professor Ben Carpenter, and Professor Mark Osler, who is the moving force behind this particular symposium. I'm also grateful to the leaders who are contributing to this conversation on an important and timely topic. It is especially important for a Catholic law school to be the venue for this conversation for reasons I will briefly explain. As a young attorney, I worked as part of a team defending a toxic tort class action lawsuit. One of my jobs was to conduct deathbed depositions of class members who were unlikely to survive until trial. One of the depositions stands out in my mind because the deponent was literally on her deathbed, hospitalized in the late stages of a cancer that she alleged was caused by my client's operations. As I entered the room, she looked up from her bed, and I knew that in her eyes, I was the personification of evil, standing in as the corporation that was responsible for her impending death. At that moment, I did not know how to respond. I had my dark suit, my deposition outline, and a zeal to make sure that my client received a robust defense against this woman's allegations. But as she lay in her hospital bed, I felt suddenly inadequate to the task of acknowledging her, her humanity while staying true to the reason I was there. This tension was not limited to the dramatic cases. In a run-of-the-mill contract dispute, I visited our client's headquarters to sit down with the mid-level manager at the center of the allegations, planning to spend only a couple of hours outlining our discovery plan and getting his input. He was an emotional wreck. I quickly realized that the lawsuit was taking a large emotional toll on him and his family. He was not yet in a position to talk about the discovery plan. He simply needed to talk. In both of those cases, I changed up my approach in order to better engage the emotional outlook of those who depended on my work and on whom my work depended. I spent more time being present and listening, delayed or discarded some of my agenda items, and worked to convey my recognition of their pain. I can never be sure that my efforts made a meaningful difference to them, but both episodes had an impact on me, reminding me that the lawyer's work is relational and at times intensely personal. On reflection, what troubles me is that in both cases, I felt as though I needed to step out of the lawyer's role temporarily in order to be fully present as a person. Whether it was my own preconceptions about lawyers, the vision of legal practice hardwired into me by law school, the adversarial mindset emphasized by my law firm training, or some combination thereof, I carried an unduly narrow understanding of the lawyer's work. I recognized the gravity of those encounters and my need to respond with empathy because of other sources of moral formation in my life. My parents, Sunday school teachers, friends, and a familiarity with suffering that comes through life experience. But I had not yet deliberately or thoughtfully invested those moral influences with professional relevance. It was only by encountering the messiness of the human condition through actual legal practice that I became broadly, authentically, and effectively formed as a lawyer. So why do I share this story as an introduction to a symposium on clemency? Because American lawyers have not traditionally spent a lot of time focusing on mercy. 
it may be tempting to view it as a topic that requires to step out of the lawyer's role as more of a fuzzy, feel-good topic best left for Sunday school and sermonizing. To the students here, I urge you to resist the temptation. It is so important for law students to be part of this conversation, both for the substance of what is being discussed and because of who the participants are. We are talking about mercy with the governor's general counsel, with elected officials, with scholars who have dedicated their careers to this subject, which clients, with clients who are working on these efforts. Pope Francis has called us to push back on what he calls a culture of indifference and instead build a culture of encounter. What does that mean as lawyers presented with the stark reality of mass incarceration? Can we look past the statistics and see the person? If I could go back to the moment before I walked into that hospital room nearly 25 years ago, I wish I could reassure my younger self. This is not a distraction from what it means to be a lawyer. This is the heart of what it means. That goes for today's conversation, too. Welcome to St. Thomas, and I'll turn it over to Professor Osler. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm going to briefly go before uh, Professor Osler. Um, my name is Robert Roloff. I have the, I'm the uh, incoming managing editor of the St. Thomas Law Journal. I have the pleasure of introducing our panelists. Um, so I'm just going to speak briefly. Um, you can also find this information on the QR code. Uh, starting with uh, Gina Evans, uh, furthest away from me. Um, Gina Evans is the Director of Advocacy at Minnesota Adult and Team Challenge. She has over 25 years of experience working with substance abuse disorder and the criminal legal system both inside and outside of institutions. Starting in 2006, she spent her professional career uh, lobbying for earmark funding, developing relationships in the public schools, implementing Know the Truth, Minnesota's largest and most utilized drug and alcohol prevention program. Last year, uh, Know the Truth impacted over 55,000 young people in Minnesota and Wisconsin schools. Since 2009, she's been developing and facilitating training with legal, behavior health, and social service professionals to help them better serve those suffering from substance use disorder and mental illness. Genius passion is helping others who also struggle with life controlling issues find freedom. She currently serves on the board of directors for the Minnesota Justice Research Center and the Minnesota Second Chance Coalition. Uh, next, we have uh, Representative Jamie Long. Um, in his second term representing Southwest Minneapolis in the Minnesota House, uh, Jamie currently serves as the chair of the Climate and Energy Committee. Jamie is active on criminal justice reform, serving on both the Public Safety and Judiciary Committee. Jamie attended George Washington Law School and Carleton College. And then closest to me, uh, we have uh, Carl Procaccini, uh, who is the, serving as the General Counsel and Deputy Chief of Staff in the Office of Governor uh, Tim Walz and Lieutenant Governor Penny Flanagan. In that role, he serves as a Senior Advisor to the Governor and Lieutenant Governor and leads the Office's legal and appointments teams. Carl also serves as an adjunct professor here at the University of St. Thomas School of Law, and he was previously a partner at Green Espel. In recognition of his work on the state's, on the state's response to COVID-19, Carl was named an Attorney of the Year by Minnesota Lawyer, and he received the Minnesota State Bar Association's Public Attorney Award of Excellence. Carl is a fellow of the American Bar Foundation, and he has previously been recognized as a rising star by Minnesota Super Lawyers and a North Star lawyer by the Minnesota State Bar Association. Carl received his JD from Harvard Law School, his LLM in International and Comparative Law from the American University in Cairo, and his AB from Harvard College. At the start of his legal career, Carl clerked for judges Diana E. Murphy and Michael J. Davis. Um, now, uh, introducing our, um, our moderator, uh, Professor Osler, if you uh, go to this school, you've heard of Professor Osler, is an amazing uh, 
professor. Uh, unfortunately, I was not able to take his crim law class, so it is my deepest regret. Um, <laughs> and um, his, yeah, I mean, if you look at his bio, it's like an entire page on here, so you know he's, he's definitely worthy of uh, moderating this conversation. Um, and he's also a great follow on Twitter. So if you guys are out there, um, so yeah, we'll give him a round of applause as he comes up here. Well, welcome, everybody. I'm, I'm so glad to see so many familiar faces here. And uh, this is such a pleasure for me to get to do this, um, that when Madison talked about what, was, what the idea was, I realized that what I was going to get to do was call up my heroes and say, come talk to these students that we love. And that's an incredibly happy occasion. Um, now, about clemency generally, uh, the, the dean mentioned that perhaps when we talk about clemency, it, it can be too easily dismissed as sort of a feel-good topic. And for those of us that are deep in the work, um, <laughs> that couldn't be less true. It's usually a feel-bad topic. Um, and, and the reason is because it is so much about deep tragedy, about deep human loss about a process that dehumanizes people and where our task is to bring out the humanity in them. Very often, the person who receives grace from all this isn't those we work for, it's us. I was talking to Cynthia Roseberry uh, a moment ago, and I mentioned that five or six years ago, there was a guy who reached out to our clinic uh, named Luke Keller. And Luke had a very long sentence for methamphetamine, had done an incredible job of rehabilitating himself. One of those people that when you go into a prison, and I did this, the people who work there say, this is the person who should get out. But he hadn't served enough time really to have a serious chance of it. You know, he hadn't gotten to the halfway point at that time. And so I wrote back to him and said, I'm sorry, but we can't take your case. And not long after that, I got a package from him. And he had made this in the shop at the prison. And that's from someone we turned down. Um, and that's not an uncommon experience for those of us who, who are in this work. Uh, and the thing about today is that we're, we're going to be looking at two different systems. This first panel is going to be addressing the system that we have in Minnesota. And then the second panel is going to be addressing different aspects of the federal system of clemency. Um, on each panel, we have someone who's directly affected or has been directly affected by the system. Um, we're going to hear uh, shortly an overview of the Minnesota system, which is completely bizarre. Um, we have a very strange system here. And when uh, I had long worked on federal clemency, and someone challenged me and said, why don't you look into your own state system? That's important, too. And so I did, and I went to a pardon hearing, and I couldn't believe what I was seeing, which is, well, here is people without a lawyer seeking, a, seeking clemency appearing personally in front of the governor, the attorney general, and the chief justice of the Supreme Court trying to pitch their case with no training. Um, and then the tribunal deciding on the fly and discussing it in front of the person being decided upon. Um, it, was, it was really a unique experience, and it remains that way. Um, but you heard the introductions. We have really two stellar panels. In this first one, uh, these are perhaps uh, among the three most committed people in the state to making things different and to challenging what's wrong. We're very lucky to have them here. And we're going to start with Carl. Thank you, Professor. Um, I just have the clicker here. Oh, yeah. How about that? Does that work? Great. All right. Well, thank you so much, Professor Osler. And um, I think I speak for all of the panelists when I say, you know, we all look up to you and um, have learned so much from you about this topic and thank you for bringing us all together today. And thanks for Madison, for, I lost where Madison is, but thank you for organizing, uh, <laughs> you are Madison. Thanks for organizing this uh, and the, the university and the law school, Dean Vischer, 
I see Dean Nichols too. Um, it's nice to be here in this capacity. Um, as was mentioned, I'm an adjunct professor here um, at, at the law school. Um, I love doing that, and I but I teach in a very different area. I teach in international anti-corruption law, which was my specialty before I joined the governor's office. Um, and I, I will admit that when I took the job as the governor's general counsel, I didn't I didn't know much. Uh, I didn't know anything about pardons, and uh, and I realized very quickly what an important part of the job it was. And so I had the good fortune of meeting very early on with Professor Osler, uh, who uh, quickly brought me up to speed on what I needed to know. And it's been a, it's been a three year journey, uh, learning about the process, working to improve the process, working with folks like Gina and uh, Representative Long uh, to try to um, improve some of those things, uh, some of the oddities of our process. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about that today. But first I'll just um, set the stage a little bit with some background uh, in context on Minnesota's system, and I'll take about 20 minutes. We have plenty of time for discussion. Um, so clemency in Minnesota, and, and uh, I'll say that, uh, uh, I'll start by saying uh, clemency is not a legal proceeding, but it is, it is a very important uh, uh, process for lawyers to be involved in, uh, and it is uh, a really important part of the, the criminal justice system uh, as a whole. And so in 1949, the, the Minnesota Supreme Court explained that, that a pardon was the exercise of the sovereign's prerogative of mercy. And so, um, you know, in criminal law, you may have learned about all the different purposes of criminal law, and you, and you get to a pardon sort of at the end of that process, and you're really talking about things like redemption and, and mercy. And uh, the pardon is, is really an act of forgiveness on behalf of the sovereign, on behalf of the state uh, or the country. Um, in, in a process of redemption for people who have uh, been able to um, redeem themselves through through their acts since they've they've committed a crime, and it's not a judicial remedy or proceeding. It is a, an executive proceeding, uh, and, and as we'll learn, there's some judicial involvement uh, in the proceeding, uh, but it is it is a uniquely executive function. Um, so who, who serves on the Minnesota Board of Pardons? We have a Board of Pardons in this state, and it's chaired by the governor. Uh, the Attorney General serves on the board, as does the Chief Justice of the Minnesota Supreme Court. As Professor Osler mentioned, that's a pretty unique structure, um, and, uh, and it's a very unmediated process, and we'll talk a little bit about those meetings. Uh, the Secretary of the Board, by statute, is the Commissioner of Corrections. Um, and the Commissioner of Corrections facilitates the process by providing applications, processing those, uh, screening applications, um, providing background checks, all the stuff that goes into uh, preparing for a, um, for a meeting. There are actually three types of clemency in Minnesota. Uh, and this is a bit different and, and unique um, uh, from the, the federal system and for most other states. Um, we grant uh, uh, what you would call a, a sort of a traditional pardon, uh, which could be absolute or conditional, uh, and those are generally granted to those who are currently serving their sentence. Uh, this pardon sets aside and nullifies the conviction. It's as though the, the crime did not um, occur and the conviction uh, is not there. Um, and, and these can be absolute or conditional. Conditional, uh, in, historically, uh, Minnesota governors would put conditions on pardons, including requiring the person to leave the state and never come back. Um, and there are all sorts, all sorts of other conditions uh, through history that, that, that governors have used. Um, as we'll get to in a moment, this particular form of relief has been relatively rare in the modern era, so we don't have a lot of examples of conditional pardons recently. We don't have a lot of examples of any pardons recently, to be, to be honest. Uh, a commutation is a, a different form of relief. It's a substitution of a different penalty. Um, so you could, uh, the, the board could grant a shorter sentence or um, put somebody on supervised release rather than a custodial sentence. Uh, the, the big distinction here is that the commutation doesn't actually erase uh, the, the conviction itself. It's, it's about the sentence. And then finally, and this is a unique creature of Minnesota statute, we have the pardon extraordinary, which is uh, granted to those who have completed their sentence um, and there are some waiting periods involved with this that we'll discuss. Um, the pardon extraordinary has the same feel and flavor as the, the ordinary pardon, um, and it has the effect of uh, setting aside and nullifying the, commission, the, the conviction. 
Um, the only um, sort of caveat there is that recipients of a pardon extraordinary um, are required to disclose the conviction in other uh, subsequent judicial proceedings or in the licensing process to be a peace officer. So there are some limitations to state clemency. Um, the, the first being that the Minnesota Board of Pardons can only grant pardons for Minnesota crime. So you, um, so you have to have been convicted of a crime, and this is a bit different than the federal system where you can have that sort of prospective pardon uh, for crimes that may have been committed but, um, but not actually convicted. I'm oh, sorry, committed but not convicted. Um, and the relief is limited to Minnesota state convictions. And uh, the relief does not apply to convictions in other states or federal convictions. So um, those, are, those are the limits of uh, the Board of Pardons authority. So quickly talking about the eligibility requirements, the application process and timelines. Um, there are actually no statutory eligibility requirements for those um, first two categories that we talked about, that pardon absolute um, or the commutation. The pardon extraordinary uh, has some statutory uh, requirements. You have to have served and discharged your sentence, and that includes any um, period after a, a prison sentence, supervised release. Uh, you have to complete a statutory waiting period for crimes of violence, which includes uh, felony drug offenses, that's 10 years after discharge of the sentence, and for other crimes, it's five years after discharge of the sentence. And uh, one thing to note is applicants can request a waiver uh, of that time period, and, um, and we have encouraged folks to do so, although as you'll see, there's a un unanimous vote requirement attached to those waiver requests, and in my time in the governor's office, we have not seen one granted because of that unanimous uh, requirement. And you can't have any criminal convictions during the waiting period. So this means if you're, if you're um, four years out from a, a nonviolent crime uh, and you commit another misdemeanor, it basically resets the clock. Um, the process in Minnesota, uh, there's, there are two application deadlines because there are generally two meetings. There's a spring meeting and a fall winter meeting. Um, and as I said before, the Department of Corrections conducts a thorough background check. And it also uh, reaches out to certain uh, players uh, re related to the original crime. So we reach out to the uh, sentencing judge if they're um, still serving. Uh, and if not, we reach out to the judge, a judge in that district, uh, the prosecutor who prosecuted the case, as well as the victim. And all of them are invited to provide written feedback uh, and if uh, victims wish to testify uh, at, the, at the meeting, uh, they're given time to do so. Uh, the meetings are generally in June and December, um, and we hold hearings on pardons, commutations, and the, and the pardons extraordinary. Um, those waivers of the waiting period and applications to rehear a case are heard on the papers. Uh, there, and as I mentioned earlier, there are some voting requirements, and we'll, we'll, get, we'll talk about this uh, a bit more, but currently there's a unanimous vote requirement to grant any form of clemency relief, be it a, a pardon, a commutation, or pardon extraordinary, and there's also that unanimous uh, vote requirement to waive the waiting period. Uh, only two votes of the board are required to uh, rehear a case that has been denied in the past. So what do these meetings look like? Um, it's, it's not unlike, the, the setting is not unlike this room uh, where you've got three members of the board and members of the public in the gallery and each um, applicant comes before the board and provides testimony. So you can see here in this picture you've got um, applicants sitting in the chairs uh, on the right side and, and you've got the, they're staring at the board in front of them. It's a, a, a pretty remarkable uh, scene when it's in person. The past a couple of years we've done these uh, uh, remotely, but uh, we'll be getting back to in person. And I encourage folks, if you're interested in this process, come and see it, you know, and, and watch a half day or a day of the Board of Pardons uh, in session. Uh, they're open to the public. Applicants briefly address the board. They can bring other individuals to speak on their behalf, and they often do, family members, coworkers. Um, and, and the testimony can be really, really moving. Uh, victims also have an opportunity to speak, and, and victims sometimes come in full support of the pardon and sometimes come in, in, in vehement uh, opposition. 
And the board members ask questions directly of the applicants themselves uh, about the offense, uh, their rehabilitation efforts, and, and any criminal record they might have had since, uh, since they were discharged. So now I'll just give you a quick um, brief on some of the um, recent developments in Minnesota. Uh, as I mentioned before, we, um, we hadn't seen when, when, uh, when we had that first meeting in 2019, Professor, uh, the Professor let me know that we hadn't granted an actual commutation or pardon in decades. And that came as a surprise to me uh, because, you know, when you think, I think when most of us think of pardons, we think somebody's getting out of prison, somebody's, you know, um, getting some, some relief from a, uh, a long sentence. And in fact, in, in about three decades, we, we hadn't seen that in Minnesota. Uh, so we uh, worked hard to identify cases that would, um, that would qualify for that sort of relief. And it's been very gratifying to see in just the past couple of years, we granted the first commutation in 28 years in Minnesota in June of 2020. The second commutation in December of that year, the first absolute pardon in more than 35 years in January of 2021. And then we just had our third commutation a few months ago in December 2021. And I'll, I'll give you just a quick synopsis of some of those cases. Uh, the first is uh, Kelly Karen who was serving uh, two concurrent sentences for first degree uh, and second degree possession. She'd already served six years. She had a concurrent federal sentence, which uh, I will say probably um, helped us get to the, the first commutation in 28 years um, because it meant that when she finished her, her state sentence, she was still serving a federal sentence. Um, there was support from the sentencing judge, and this is critical. Um, and noted that uh, the current guidelines would no longer support the length of the sentence that she had originally been sentenced to. Uh, she also had support from the prosecutors who prosecuted the case. And, and again, noting that difference between a commutation and a pardon, they supported the commutation but not the pardon. Uh, and uh, ultimately the board uh, sentenced uh, or commuted her sentence to supervised release. Um, and, and Ms. Karen, to the best of my understanding, is still seeking a federal pardon of her federal sentence. Um, but she was the first in 20, 28 years. And you may have heard about our second commutation in 28 years. That was uh, the Mayan Burrell case. Um, uh, Mr. Burrell was serving uh, life plus 12 months, and he also had a, another consecutive sentence on top of that. Um, he was 16 when he committed the offense. He'd already served 18 years when the board heard the case. Um, I say on the slide there's an independent expert review of conviction and, and sentence. Uh, Professor, I believe you were the chair of that um, review. Uh, a really thorough review by uh, a group of experts, national experts from across the country. Uh, and, and based on that report and based on all the information that, that we had in front of us, um, we um, made the recommendation and the, and the, and the governor was uh, interested in commuting this sentence. And so, again, not a pardon, not a forgiveness um, of the crime itself. And I think that there's still um, a, a debate in the expert review was, was uh, uh, more equivocal on the question of actual innocence, but the question of sentencing felt pretty clear uh, for a juvenile to receive life plus 12. And the consecutive sentence um, uh, was um, uh, a, a difficult thing for the, for the board to accept. And, um, and so the board commuted that sentence to 20 years uh, and the remainder to be served on supervised release. And so as you can see from the slide, he had served almost 18 years. He is now, um, uh, Mr. Burrell is now serving those last couple of years on supervised release outside of prison. Um, one procedural quirk to note on this case is this was actually um, a, this relief was granted on a, a two-vote basis because the Chief Justice recused given her involvement in Mr. Burrell's prosecution when she was at the Hennepin County Attorney's Office. And finally, our first absolute pardon in 35 years went to uh, Maria Elizondo. Um, she was serving a 10-year probationary sentence um, and, and had $24,000 of restitution uh, to repay the state um, for wrongfully obtaining um, public benefits assistance and identity thefts. Uh, when she applied, she had already served eight years and paid $10,000 in restitution. Um, 
but this case took on a new, a new life um, given the immigration consequences of her offense. She was put into, um, uh, potentially put into deportation proceedings um, and, um, and so getting this pardon not only meant uh, allowing her to move on from this crime, but it also meant preventing her deportation um, uh, from the country that she had lived in most of her life. Um, uh, she had a hearing in December 2020. Uh, there was some hesitancy on behalf of at least one of the board members related to the fact that she had not repaid her restitution. Uh, rather than denying the, the pardon, the board continued uh, the case until January of last year to give her time to repay that restitution. Uh, and, a, and again, another shout out to Professor Osler and his students who uh, got together and uh, raised the money to repay the, rest, the balance of her restitution payment. Uh, and the board granted that pardon in January of 2021. So uh, just to, to wrap up, a couple of trends uh, that we've been looking at. We've really tried to dig into the data um, over the past um, couple of years. And uh, the folks who work with me know that I'm kind of a data person and I like to, to understand the numbers and the trends. And what you see in this chart is uh, a real increase in the number of applications in the past couple of years. And um, there are a lot of different factors that we can talk about that have played into this. I think the publicity of some of these landmark um, cases that we just talked, to, talked about have raised the profile um, of pardons in Minnesota. Um, I'd like to think that some of our offices outreach to commu community groups. Uh, I've given presentations to the public defenders, to um, uh, various uh, of our uh, affinity groups, uh, to spread the word about pardons and to, and to get people excited about applying. Um, and I think we are getting to a point where um, uh, people are seeing that people are getting pardons. And, uh, and it's not a futile effort uh, to, to make the application. So you'll see we had an average of 67 applications heard in the last decade starting in 2010. And then in 2020 and 2021, uh, we went to 89 and then 151 applications. So more than double the number of applications that we had seen in the previous decade. And another, another clear trend that we've seen is, is that the board is granting more pardons uh, than they had in the past. Um, 10 years, and again, there are a lot of factors that I think play into that. Um, but we, from 2010 to 2019, we had an average of about 40% of applications granted. Uh, in the past two years, we've seen 74% and 71% of uh, the pardon extraordinary applications granted in each of those years. So you combine those two factors, more applications and more applications granted on a percentage basis, and it means you grant more applications. And so um, again, in that same time period, 2010 to 2019, we saw about 15 applications granted a year. Um, in 2020, the board granted 29 applications. And in 2021, we got to 41 applications, which um, as far as I can tell is, is an all-time high. This is great. We feel good about it. But when you look in, in context in comparison to other states, Minnesota still has a long way to go. Uh, if you look at this chart, you can almost can't decipher where Minnesota is because we're that dark blue line that looks like we're flatlined despite the increase um, over the past few years. And, I've, and I, what I did was I, uh, to, be, to be honest, and uh, folks who, who study in this area know it's hard to get this data. And so I picked three states that were roughly our population or lower and where I could get the data. And, and that was Alabama, Arkansas, and Connecticut, very different states, very different politics, very different prison populations. All those states, the, the one thing they have in common is that they grant you know, orders of magnitude more pardons than we do here in Minnesota. And so um, I, I would say we still have a long way to go. I think the governor would say that. And, um, and we're doing our best to spread the word, to, to identify folks who are really deserving of clemency and, and the relief that the board can grant. Um, I'm realizing that I'm a little over time, so I'm going to move quickly, quickly through the Shifa case, uh, which is, so there's not a lot of case law about pardons in Minnesota. Uh, we had an opportunity to get some clarification in the law over the past couple of years. Um, and, uh, and that opportunity came uh, from, from Ms. Amrea Shifa, who was a victim of a, a brutal sexual assault um, over a long period of time. Uh, and eventually she killed the perpetrator who was her husband. Uh, she was convicted of manslaughter in 2015. She was released from a, a prison sentence in 2018. Um, 
but was still serving a, a supervisory sentence. She was put into deportation proceedings and detained in ICE detention. And her initial application for a pardon was heard in 2019. Um, that application and the hearing was continued until 2020, and eventually uh, her application was denied uh, in June of 2020 based on a 2-1 vote in favor of the pardon. Uh, the governor and the attorney general voted in favor of that pardon, and the chief justice voted against it. Um, this teed up a, an important constitutional question that uh, I think a lot of us have been pondering for some time. Uh, the Constitution says that the governor, in conjunction with the Board of Pardons, has the power to grant reprieves and pardons. And the statute says that every pardon or commutation of sentence shall have no force or effect unless granted by a unanimous vote of the board. And uh, I think it was the view of many uh, who looked at this that um, there was some inconsistency between the constitutional language and the statute, and, and Ms. Shifa brought a case to, um, uh, to highlight that. Uh, her, case, so she, her case challenged a statutory unanimous vote requirement. Um, she and the governor argued that the, and I, I should say, she sued the entire board. She sued the attorney general, governor, and chief justice. Uh, the governor happened to agree with her. So uh, we sort of switched to the other side of the V in this case. And uh, we hired our own counsel to represent the governor in this case. Uh, we had two primary arguments. The, um, uh, the, the unanimous vote requirement doesn't square with that constitutional language in conjunction with, we didn't think, meant unanimous. And we also had an argument that the inclusion of the Chief Justice on the, on the um, Board of Pardons and, and her ability to veto a pardon under the unanimous vote requirement violated the separation of powers. Um, the Attorney General and the Chief Justice took the other side and defended the statute. So round one uh, went to Ms. Shifa and the Governor. Um, the district court judge agreed with us and said that the unanimous vote requirement uh, was unconstitutional because it didn't give effect to those words the governor in conjunction with. The attorney general and chief justice appealed. Given the um, urgency of Ms. Shifa's case, we agreed to skip directly to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court had a different view. Um, the Supreme Court held that the, the statutes are constitutional as written. This, the court likened uh, the, this in conjunction, in conjunction with language to missile launch keys, which is to say that both the governor and the board are indispensable parties in this process, and they both have to agree um, to, to grant a pardon. And I should, I'll, I'll just say as an aside, the, the Chief Justice's attorney argued that in fact uh, there were no indispensable votes, and that the legislature could set any sort of voting rule it wanted, including one that would um, say that uh, the AG and the Chief Justice alone could grant the pardon. Um, the Supreme Court rejected that argument, um, and, uh, but the Supreme Court also rejected Ms. Shifa and the governor's argument that, in fact, the unanimous vote requirement was, was in violation of the Constitution. And, and what the court held is this is up to the legislature. The governor and the board are indispensable and it's up to the legislature. And we'll, we'll get to, to the legislative path here in a moment. But it's up to the legislature to set those rules for the board. And the, board and, the, and the legislature can say that the board, which is the governor, the AG, and the chief justice, all have to agree in order for them to turn uh, the launch key. So it was a disappointing result, I'm not going to lie, uh, and uh, di disappointing for Ms. Shifa and disappointing for, for pardon applicants because um, the, the higher bar you set uh, to, to achieve a pardon, the, the more difficult it is to, to get one. Um, but there, there is hope. Uh, the Supreme Court definitely did not say that, that we had to have a unanimous vote requirement, and um, I'm going to turn it over to my friend, Representative Long, to talk a little bit about uh, the proposed statutory reform that he's been pursuing for the past couple of years. Thanks so much, Carl. Uh, well, good to be with everybody. Thanks for the invitation to be here on this really important topic. So I'm just going to start real quick before I dive into the bill and just putting uh, this conversation in context in the legislature. So uh, I'm in the House. The uh, Democrats are in the majority in the House. Uh, folks may know that in the Senate, uh, the Republicans are in the majority. So we're one of only two split legislatures in the entire country right now. Virginia's uh, the other one. Uh, so that means we need to, to work together on, on things if we're going to see uh, any progress. I've been on the Public Safety Committee um, for the last, my whole time. I'm, this is my fourth year. Um, and uh, there's a lot of things that I care about personally in the public safety context. I, I care a lot about 
sentencing. I care a lot about um, police reform, but I've spent most of my time focusing on post-conviction um, because to me that's been the area that I think uh, there has the most opportunity for bipartisanship and the most opportunity for agreement. Uh, and so I, we had a, a big win. Uh, actually, we didn't quite, it was a bipartisan bill. We didn't quite get it through the legislature, but we had a, a big win thanks to the Sentencing Guidelines Commission uh, last session in trying to help uh, reform our probation laws, which are also out of step with the entire country, or were. And we had probation sentences of up to 40 years, and we're able to cap those at five. We're working really hard uh, this year on uh, the Clean Slate Act, uh, which is an automatic expungement bill that I'm, I'm carrying. Uh, and, and this bill also fits into that uh, mold of trying to help uh, provide people second chances, to help pe provide people the opportunity um, to demonstrate that they have rehabilitated, to demonstrate that they uh, are able to um, get access to jobs and opportunities that they wouldn't otherwise have. So this, I think, is a really important uh, part of that conversation of what should happen after sentence, what should happen uh, when somebody's been able to do what we've asked them to do, to rehabilitate themselves, to uh, demonstrate that they have overcome the challenges of their past. So that's, you know, the context in which uh, this conversation uh, is happening. And then I think uh, Carl and Professor Osler, you know, teed up Minnesota as a bit of an outlier in a number of ways. We, we do like to think of ourselves as sort of exceptional, and, <laughs> and in this way we are, but not in quite the way we'd want to be. So. Uh, we, uh, if you kind of put us in context for other states and, and how hard it is to get a pardon here, um, there's a, a number of different ways you could look at it, but, but the, by the way I look at it, I, we're one of the six worst, uh, or at least six hardest, in terms of the ability to grant uh, a pardon. And that's because we, we don't really have a process other than uh, what Carl outlined for uh, folks going individually in front of three of the busiest people in the entire state to plead their case personally. Um, and we don't, and we have this three unanimous vote requirement uh, as a state. So there are really only five other states that have that level of burden. Um, and so that, that makes us a real outlier. It's really difficult to get three people to agree on things. We're, we're finding that right now. We got the governor, the <laughs> majority leader, and the speaker <laughs> locked in rooms, you know, negotiating, and uh, it's hard for them to, to reach agreement. Uh, it's certainly hard when people have different standards of what they think uh, demonstrates rehabilitation, what they think uh, an individual should be able to show to be able to get a pardon in a certain circumstance. People have different bars. Um, and so, you know, this really isn't even about who is in these positions right now. And we'll talk a little bit about some of the, I'll talk briefly about one or two examples, but, but it's just about the, the system that we've set up and the structure of having three unanimous votes uh, to be able to grant a particular pardon is a higher bar than almost any other state. So we um, have been trying to uh, write that, uh, you know, challenge <laughs> to our pardon system, and we have uh, a bill that would, would do that. Um, we had a great hearing just a couple of weeks ago, which Professor Osser uh, uh, testified in uh, on the bill. And the bill would do uh, a few things. It was also the week of Second Chance Day, wasn't it? So, <laughs> which, which Gina's organization uh, uh, helped put on. So um, the bill would have sort of two big reforms. Um, the first is that we would deal with the, the pipeline challenge uh, of having um, everything get funneled through three decision makers. And there's a lot of states that have better approaches. Uh, one of those states is South Dakota, which is what we have sort of modeled our system on. So we would set up a clemency review commission. Um, and their job would essentially be to have that screening uh, of applicants that are coming in. So you saw, you know, 250% increase uh, over the last few years in terms of the number of applicants. There's no way that um, those three individuals are going to have the ability to hear all those cases individually, particularly if that trend continues to go up. Um, and so this, this uh, review commission uh, would help by screening these petitions, making recommendations to the full board. The full board would still retain its full discretion to be able to make the final determination. Um, but it would have nine members, you know, three each from uh, the current board members and they would review these applications. So that's, I think, would be a really important reform uh, to try to help get more, uh, more individual cases through the process and also to ease the burden on um, the, the three uh, uh, board members. 
Uh, we would also um, remove the Commissioner of Corrections, who's currently the Secretary of the Board. Uh, so, you know, the, the Commissioner who runs the entire correction system for the entire state is sort of supposed to be the lead staff person for uh, <laughs> the three other busiest people. So you can see why that uh, probably is not the best approach. Uh, and then also there's, um, as Carl notes in the slide, some, some potential conflicts of interest or, or uh, roles with, with having the person who is meant to oversee the correction system also advising on what the, the pardon process should be. Uh, so that's the, you know, the first big change uh, that the bill would make. The second is that we would respond to the Shifa decision that, that Carl outlined, uh, where they made very clear that this is in the legislature's hands, uh, how we define in conjunction with. And um, we have a certain definition that's in statute right now, which I explained is out of step with how most other states do it, which is the unanimous requirement. So we would have a very straightforward answer uh, in our bill, which is that it would be the governor plus one other vote that could grant a pardon. So that's what we think in conjunction with means. You have to have a majority. The governor can't do it by himself. Uh, neither can the attorney general and the chief justice do it by themselves. Uh, but in conjunction is the governor plus one other vote. Um, so that is very clearly consistent with, with the Supreme Court decision. They made, they made explicit that that is one of the possible interpretations that would be constitutional. So there's no doubt there anymore. If, if the legislature enacted this, then it would be upheld, at least by this court, and it would be constitutional. So we could uh, move forward uh, with that. Uh, and then we would also um, collapse the uh, pardon extraordinary um, uh, distinction right now between a pardon, which, which as uh, Carl explained, was, is also a unique approach to Minnesota. So we, um, in our hearing, uh, uh, I mentioned Professor Osler uh, testified and uh, gave some uh, expert, uh, excellent testimony on, on behalf of the bill. Uh, we also heard, heard from two individuals, and I just wanted to you know, share a little bit about, about their stories. So we heard uh, from Amber uh, Yoakum, uh, who is <laughs> Gina's good friend, uh, and did a, uh, an amazing job. She was, uh, she was granted a pardon, so she's one of the happy stories. Um, she had to you know, wait for the 10-year waiting period that was, that was outlined. Uh, she'd asked for an early pardon, but uh, was turned down. Oh, she, got no, she, got, she got the early she pardon did. in 2017. Yeah, she did get an early pardon. That's right. Um, and the reasons that she gave was wanting to volunteer. She wanted to help out at her grandkids' schools. She wanted to go to 4-H. She wanted to go back to help at the county jails. Um, and she also talked about uh, the, her family uh, and her desire to adopt her grandkids, which she couldn't do at that time. Sorry, I get choked up <laughs> when I talk about these stories. But so she, uh, she said that the pardon helped her feel normal, helped her feel whole. Uh, and so she was able to, to get that pardon and told her really moving story. And then we heard uh, from Tim Morin, uh, who was not a happy story. So Tim, uh, if you can picture, <laughs> is a burly firefighter with like what you would picture as a firefighter's mustache, you know. <laughs> uh, and he was in tears basically the entire time. Uh, he was giving his testimony. I had to turn my camera off because I couldn't, you know, listen to his story. So <clears throat> Tim, uh, had an aggravated robbery conviction, uh, I think 15 years ago or so, uh, when he was, yeah, 19, uh, and somebody died in the um, uh, context of the crime. He was not charged for the death, but it happened in the course of the aggravated robbery. Uh, so, you know, he talked about his journey to <laughs> be able to get to a point where he was, you know, felt like he was man enough or whole enough to be able to actually apply for a pardon. <clears throat> he was supported uh, in his pardon by the victim's family. He was supported by everybody along the process, uh, but he only got two votes. And the reason was that, is that the Chief Justice uh, has a rule, which is a fair rule, you know, but <laughs> it's her, her uh, decision that if anybody dies in the course of the c committing of the crime, no pardon. So that was her rule. So, you know, it didn't matter sort of how much he had demonstrated uh, his rehabilitation or his ability to uh, come to terms with uh, the, you know, the, the action he'd done. He's uh, currently a firefighter. He's an EMT. He uh, received an award uh, for um, saving somebody's life. Uh, you know, he 
uh, has volunteered, uh, and he wanted to, you know, be able to go move on with his life uh, and show that he had rehabilitated. So anyway, I just wanted to share some of the, the powerful stories that we heard uh, in our committee. Uh, so uh, we're in the legislative process right now. Uh, we're, you know, pushing hard on this. It's a tough conversations. I think that um, there are those who, who support the current uh, approach, who support having a, a three vote uh, majority. But we're going to keep fighting. Uh, we, um, you know, we're in the middle of legislative session right now, so we still have a couple of uh, more months before we get to the end of session. Uh, but I think that we, you know, we know that we have um, really important uh, individuals that we're fighting on behalf of. Um, and we know that we need this structural reform. We need to give people these second chances. So thank you. Probably you'll be able to yeah. see me better. Right? Yeah, come on. I was going to stand up over there. Yeah. Um, so first of all, Representative Long, thank you for always being our second chance champion. Like, I just appreciate you so much. Um, so my name is Gina Evans, and um, I, um, I'm just going to give you a brief, um, like, where I came from, right? So I um, started shooting meth at 15 and um, came from a background of trauma and um, addiction, crime. Um, my family system was super dysfunctional. Um, uh, to no one's surprise, um, I ended up with 13 felony convictions, been, been to Shakopee Women's Prison three different times. Um, all, I have 13 felony convictions, all low-level nonviolent um, convictions. Um, and the system is such that um, if you don't do well on probation, you go to prison. Um, and every time I would go to prison, um, I would learn, I would become a more sophisticated criminal, right? Went to prison my first time for one-tenth of a gram of methamphetamines. And while I was there, I learned how to commit check forgery. And back then, they didn't have an identity theft statute. So I went to prison my second time for um, uh, false representation. Um, uh, what did they call it then? Oh, I usually know this stuff. Anyways, it was what they called it before they had an identity theft. Um, theft by false representation is what they called it. Um, and the next time I was there, my second trip to Shakopee, I, I um, left with a written out recipe for lithium-based methamphetamines. And so low level, um, right, low risk. And then, because Shakopee, Minnesota only has one women's prison, so they throw everybody in the pool, right? And so, um, and so um, by the time I was um, 24 years old, the state of Minnesota terminated my parental rights for my kids, because when you have kids, they give you one year to get your kids back um, when you're a drug addict and a mess, and then they give you a prison sentence. That's it. They got timelines. So that's my soapbox. Going to get down off of it now. Um, but um, I got my life back together. That's the good news. And I did that um, through the power of my faith and the power of God. And so. Uh, thank you, Jesus, for um, Saint, schools like St. Thomas. Um, and so, um, 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 so when I went in front of the pardon board after I went through treatment at Minnesota Adult and Teen Challenge and got my life back together and got a job at um, Teen Challenge, they told me because of my DHS, my criminal behavior, that I couldn't work at, D at Teen Challenge. And so I had to work with the legislature and do some stuff to even be able to work there. Um, and then after I had 10 years, um, after I'd been released, and that's the other thing, it's 10 years after release from supervision. That's when you can apply. Um, and so for me, it had been like 14 years that I had been sober, crime-free, all that stuff. And because of my um, length of criminal history, here, here's my pardon application. Um, it, it's super lengthy. Um, and, and like, um, I had to get 
all this information. I had to collect all these letters. I had to do all this stuff, right? And um, and I already had been with Second Chance Coalition and the work that I was doing. And so, like, the fact that I was able to put this together and was educated enough and had connections, my letters in here are from law enforcement. They're from probation. They're from, um, I even asked Paul Chanel if he would write me one. He was like, mm, conflict. Um, so, um, and I asked, um, I asked uh, Jim Backstrom if he could write me a letter. And he was like, Gina, we have a policy here. I cannot write you a letter. We don't do applications for DHS or for, um, or for pardon for anybody that's had more than one crime it, and I can't go against like my team or whatever and like two and a half weeks later I got a letter from him in the mail that said exactly that um, that he wasn't able to do it because of policy and then under it was on letterhead too and then underneath that he was like but if you ever need um, a refer a reference for a job or whatever and I threw that baby right in there <laughs> and so um, and so but that's my that was my privilege, right? Um, as a white woman, educated um, and connected, right? To be able to do this. But like, I'm not the only person that is, um, that is uh, like deserving of a pardon, you guys. There are so many others that have done the work to be able to, to, to deserve this. And so like for what it, what is it, what did this mean for me? It meant upward, upward mobility. It meant better jobs. It meant a feeling in my soul of wholeness, of like redemption, of like this bright line in the sand where 14 years earlier I had done the work and put my past behind me. That Gina that did all of these things is dead. Like, I'm not this person anymore. Um, like, sometimes I think about, like, high-speed chases with the police and, like, some of the things that I did. Um, and it feels like a book I read or a movie I saw. Like, that's, that's not who I am. But, like, that's who Chief Justice Gilday asked me about in that pardon hearing. I couldn't get through it. I cried the whole time. Um, it was the most intimidating and the hardest 15 minutes of my life sitting in front of that board. Um, and, and who could do that? Who could, like, um, I'm strong. Like, I'm well-spoken. I'm, um, and you have 15 minutes to explain yourself. Um, and it, it's a terrible process um, that you have to do this really well. You have, it's like a test. They, who can pass it other than somebody who's got their, really got their stuff together and can do it well? Um, and then you get to bring somebody. And you have to know, don't bring your mother. Like, find some, somebody, right? Um, and so, um, and I didn't know that there was marks in the world when I did mine. Um, now I get to send people and say, go talk to my friend Mark, right? Um, so the other question that um, the other I'm going to tell you a little bit about my husband too. So um, my husband got his pardon in 2018, um, and um, my husband is uh, like I'm super extroverted. My husband's super introverted. The change in my husband the day after he got his pardon was extraordinary. Like I could just see like the. It, it was like a, a switch flipped in him that like he just the he didn't have that thing on him anymore um, like he he's a pastor and like he works with like we, we own sober homes and he does all this stuff with other people and um, he he decided to quit doing that now he's in school to be a paramedic and um, asked me the other day about like do you think I could be law enforcement and I was like I don't know but no like <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely not. And so, um, but like it changes people, like to be fully restored, right? To be fully restored and like that your, like your mistakes don't have to define you anymore. Like it means something. Um, and so the other question that, um, you know, Mark asked me, like I'm, 
I'm super involved in so much stuff. I'm on a legislative task force right now for um, DHS background studies. We're looking into the 245C15 statute, which is like criminal conduct and crimes and like how long um, DHS can look at that stuff. Right now, the law, 15 years for any any felony conviction. Doesn't matter if it's a fifth degree possession or um, there's a, a bunch of crimes that are permanent, doesn't matter how long it's been, but any other thing that isn't, doesn't matter if it's a fifth degree possession or uh, I can't think of anything that's bad that's not permanent right now, but it's 15 years. And as a taxpayer, we pay for those background studies over and over and over and over again for 15 years. It is disgusting and atrocious and we're trying to fix it right now. And so looking at like the, 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 the need for this, it's like if we could get more people pardoned for those convictions, it eliminates the need for these background studies. Um, my husband did his for his, his paramedic and he got a needs more time and I was infuriated. Um, but then the very next day he got his clearance, right? Like, so it was really quick because that's the other part with it. I'm thinking what happens, and I think, do we know this? Um, when you get a pardon, it adds a line. And so DHS can still see all of it, but then like they can look at a little more closely and it says gubernatorial pardon extraordinary or whatever on there. So, um, so workforce, and we're in a workforce crisis right now. Um, and then, um, and then just, you know, that idea of jobs. And, you know, the one thing that I would, would ask and wonder, um, Carl is like, do we know the data around um, gender and race? Who's getting them? Because um, I think that's something like, if, if we're not going to be able to, you know, look at the the statute and the constitution, then you know, who who's getting them and who's not? Like, I I would I would ask that we look at that, because um, you know, yeah, I have some thoughts. We should talk about it. <laughs> I was looking to see if we had it. We don't. We yeah. Don't. And, uh, but we can. And, and we can. Yeah. 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 Yep. Yeah. We, yeah. we should talk after this because I had a thought. I had a thought. I tell you that, that having been to several hearings, race is something that I know. And although I'm not ready to hold that out as data, it, I suspect that when the data is available, it will show racial disparities. It will be troubling. Well, there's no doubt. I mean, I, but... I also am a bit of a data nerd, so, but I have a, I had a thought while we were talking I'd like to share with you, so, <laughs> not publicly, but, <laughs> um, and so um, I, I'm going to get us, try to get us back on track, and so just to take 10 minutes, but, um, so um, thank you all, that's the other thing I just want to say, thank you all for like taking up the torch of, of the law, and, um, and I love that Mark is doing this, um, because like we need more lawyers out there that, um, that, that like that empathy um, and compassion is is part of your tool belt, um, regardless of what type of law that you're getting into. Like um, to be able to see the person, whether um, you're going to be um, uh, you know county attorney or a public defender or some other kind of law, that empathy and compassion is part of your tool belt, um, and that um, you know part of that is proximity um, and that being able to understand people and their humanity going in the, uh, right out of the gate um, because we have to be able to see where people come from and their trauma um, to be able to, to um, do what you do well. And so, you know, thank you for being here and making all of this stuff part of what you're learning from the very beginning. The fact that you're here, um, that means something to me, um, learning about all of this stuff right, right out of the gate. And so um, thanks. And if you have questions for me, like I'm 100% an open book, so... Thanks. Well, in, in, in what may be a first, we're exactly on time. I don't know if that's ever happened in this room. Um, so that means that we have some time for questions. Uh, and so anything relating to, to what we've heard or about the state process? And throw up your hand. Yes, Cynthia. Those three heads. Yeah, thanks for the question. So they would, they would advise. So it would be kind of a preliminary screening. 
and then they would be making a recommendation uh, to the pardon board. And so the final determination would stay with the pardon board. Yeah, and I'd, I'd add too that the way that the bill is structured, each of the three existing members of the board would appoint three members of the commission. And so they would have an impact in that way too, that they'd have people they trust on the, on the commission. Other questions? This is kind of a question for everyone, um, but I couldn't help but notice the dates of like the first pardons in 28 years. Do you think that recent events the pandemic, George Floyd, do you think that has made a shift in perspective from our public figures? Are they being more merciful because of collective experiences and maybe a renewed interest on criminal justice? Um, well, I can tell you a big push for what has happened on a few of them has been public outcry. Um, the My Umbrella, um, there was a, a huge outcry and from inside and outside um, and like free my umbrella I think had a, a huge impact on um, the, the governor's office and I think some other f folks making that happen um, but I'll let Carl and I'm not sure if Carl will feel comfortable saying this, so I will. Uh, so, so there, you know, it's, the structure is important, and we kind of talked about the structure today. But uh, personnel matters too, um, and who is being willing to actually, you know, get, dig in deep and push some of these things. So, uh, you know, you haven't always had a Carl Procaccini in the general counsel's office. You haven't always had a Governor Walls, who's, uh, you know, elevated I think uh, second chances quite a bit, and the work that he's done as a governor. So I think that um, those trends aren't, aren't by accident for that either. So definitely the outside pressure mattered, but uh, the willingness uh, to do the work on the inside and have Governor Walls step up in a big way, I think has mattered too. And it, uh, I used to work for Attorney General Ellison, so I'll give a, <laughs> a shout out to him too. He's um, you know, been really engaged, I think, on, on second chances as well. Carl? Uh, I guess I would just say, I, I think it would be, we'd be kidding ourselves if any any big decision that those that those folks are making these days aren't um, influenced by the events of the past couple of years, and so I'll, I'll leave it at that. But I appreciate those thoughts, and I and and, and there has been intentionality behind uh, each step of this, and uh, and uh, I'm happy to take a little bit of credit, but I think Professor Osler and others who have been working on this gene have been working on this for years before I even understood what the process was really deserve the credit for, for making the push and, 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 and highlighting the, the salience of this issue. Um, so it was something we were very interested in in 2019 and, and, and a lot of those things started, but it, again, it would be, we'd be kidding ourselves if, if the last two years didn't have an impact too. Yeah, and I just note that, that the push started before the murder of George Floyd. Um, and one person that we should probably recognize is, is Judge Kevin Burke, who um, came to me and said, we ought to write to the governor about this. And so <laughs> I said, sure, because I do whatever judges say most of the time. And, um, and so we wrote and Carl read the letter and, and that's how we initially pushed for things. But I think one of the major impacts that we've seen after the murder of George Floyd and the increased attention to racial justice has been the increased number of applications and petitions that I, I and, and frankly that drives a lot of other things that that means that the board has to take more time and pay more attention to this and that's all to the good um, it raises the need and I think it builds on itself too because people say well you know my buddy is petitioning for a pardon I think I've got a better case than him <laughs> and so so people will put in and so I think that there there has been um, as part of a whole, uh, an increase in, in people who are affected, who are willing to engage with the system where maybe they may have been hesitant or afraid to before. It's emboldened people in a really, in a really good way. Um, and it's combined with a lot of other things. I, I mean, I'm, so Monday uh, evening coming next week, I'm gonna go speak down by George Floyd Square on no knock warrants. But you know what, this will come up. Uh, if I don't bring it up, someone will bring it up in a question. Because one of the things that's great about the work that these people have done is it's made it a part of that conversation about racial justice as it should be. The, I have a couple of things. The first one's actually quite easy. Uh, just a clarification, I think this is for you, Carl. 
the, the, um, your, your slide said their first commutation, the first pardon, or the second commutation, but then we saw data that said a whole lot of pardons. Mm -hmm. Does the data mean, do you mean pardons extraordinary by that? Yes. Um, so, again, our, our data, I'm still working on this, and Madison has dragooned me into doing a, a publication for the, for the law journal. So, good, good, so, for, good for Madison. This so, is I look, so, I, so, I, so I'm going to refine this and, and look forward to that, that article in a couple of months. Um, so the, the data that I'm showing is, is a little bit of everything. So right, this, this graph right here is actually all the relief, all the clemency. So whether it's, it, it, basically it's Parton's Extraordinary plus the four other examples that I gave, because that's it. So, so everything until 2020 is pardon extraordinary, and then in 2020 you get uh, a pardon and a commutation, and 2021 you get another couple. Um, so, um, so this graph is showing everything, but it's really it's all being driven by the pardons extraordinary right now because that's the lion's share of the applications, and it's um, the ones that the board is is granting. Good. Th thanks for just making sure I'm, I'm we're clear on that. Yeah. The other I think is for Representative Long, but but maybe for anyone, right? I mean, you mentioned your bill has not sailed through at this point, right? But maybe it'd be helpful kind of in this setting to say, like, what are the other factors, right? What's the history behind the current structure, right? Or what might be opposition to, um, to what you're hearing right now that, that you're trying to engage with? I can speak to the current, maybe Professor Oster can speak to the history, uh, but um, so <clears throat> uh, public safety criminal justice is a, a hot topic uh, right now and, and um, uh, you know, finding areas where uh, we can have, um, it, you know, I think uh, principled detailed conversations about policy can sometimes be, be a challenge. Uh, I, I think that there are some who believe that it's okay that we're an outlier, you know, it's okay that it's really hard uh, to get a pardon in the state of Minnesota, and it's okay to have a three-person unanimous vote, right? There are those, those opinions. Um, if I'm being honest, I think there is some partisan uh, loyalty that plays out here, which is just, the, you know, it's hard sometimes to separate process from who's in those roles right now. And so if you think about it, uh, we've got two Democrats and, and a Republican appointee uh, on, for the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. So there are, I think, there is some tendency, um, you know, among some Republicans to have more affinity towards the Chief Justice's point of view because of a partisan loyalty, um, rather than, you know, it, what, what my preference would be, which is to really try to take it out of that current context and look at the structure. Um, so I think those are, those are some of the challenges, but, you know, we're trying to, work through that and I think trying to, I, I think we had a pretty effective hearing at least to, to demonstrate uh, the need for this and uh, um, you know I know a number of uh, members on both sides of the aisle were pretty affected by it and, and um, so I'm hopeful that we can continue to move forward. Um, I think if the Supreme Court decision had gone the other way, our bill would, would be passing because uh, that would have put more pressure on the legislature but uh, the easiest thing to do in the legislature is nothing. Uh, and so there is a, a lot of uh, inertia to just leave things alone and, and it's always harder to persuade people to change. Yeah, just on the history part. Well, first of all, I have to say this just about the Supreme Court decision. That thing about the two keys, um, I was sitting next to Carl at the argument and he could tell I was about to leap up and make this point. But those two people who turned the nuclear launch keys, they're not the ones who make the decision. I mean, it actually was the perfect example of what we were arguing, not their argument, because the president isn't at the nuclear launch site turning the key. He sends the command and then two people do it at the same time to make sure it's not a mistake by one person. So really, it was a strong analogy to what we were arguing for. Um, but I restrained myself from leaping to my feet in the, the Supreme Court chambers, and I regret deeply not doing that. Um, but, but historically, uh, the, the move from the governor alone making the decision to it being uh, a responsibility of the board with this vague language of a conjunction with, that dates back to the late 1800s. And a governor who was viewed as being too profligate in the way that he was granting clemency. And unlike the federal constitution, which, you know, is, is 
harder to amend <laughs> in some ways um, that that you know puts it entirely in the president's hands that the state constitution is easier to amend and, and, and was. Now, in terms of the statute, we've seen a number of statutory changes, and that was a statutory change, actually, that made it the uh, unanimous vote. Um, and then it was also creation of the pardon extraordinary, I think was in the 80s, wasn't it, that that, that came about? And, and one thing about the 1980s, and, and Paul and Cynthia, who will hear on the next panel in the federal system, know this well, not all moments are equal. And in the 1980s, there was this incredible period where retributionist policies um, created all kinds of problems. I mean, the federal system, in a period of like four years, you had the creation of mandatory guidelines, the elimination of uh, bail and the establishment of presumptive deten detention. Um, you had the establishment of mandatory minimum sentences, the elimination of parole, all at once. And that was the same time that they kind of threw up this pardon extraordinary, which frankly seems pretty slapdash to me as legislation, given that there's still the pardon there um, and not much of a distinction between the two uh, other than there's more requirements imposed for the pardon extraordinary. Um, but that's, that's a thumbnail sketch on the history. Thank you, Joel. Other I just questions? have one more question. Oh, yeah. Um, given the fact that in these hearings, uh, victims are welcome to testify, uh, and I understand the political realities and also appreciate your, um, your affection for, you know, people who are, who are suffering under this, I'm wondering if there was any consideration given to suggesting that a person who was formerly convicted be on the commission so that that voice is heard in that room. Yeah, so that's a question for the legislation. That's, that's a good idea. Um, we, we left it open to the, the three individuals on the pardon board to make their three appointees. Uh, I'll note that, that Governor Walls has uh, been um, very, <laughs> leaned in quite a bit to making sure that affected individuals are appointed to boards and commissions where he's had the authority. Um, and uh, I suspect if, um, there would be some, you know, depending on the personnel, I, I, I think that would be something they would look into. But it, it wasn't in our bill, but it is a good suggestion. And just, just uh, to follow up on that too, Cynthia, um, Minnesota has done a much better job than the federal system of including formerly incarcerated people. I believe there's been a formerly incarcerated person on the Sentencing Commission yes. and uh, on a lot of other um, boards and commissions and review commissions, including the Felony Murder Task Force that has just completed its work in the state, had a formerly incarcerated person sitting on it. Um, while the legislation doesn't specifically call for appointment of someone there, it would be entirely consistent with the culture that we've seen develop that, that one of the nominees would be formally incarcerated? I would be applying, just <laughs> FYI. There you go. Um, so we have a very active, um, uh, impacted like community here in Minnesota and very vocal. Um, and so uh, we, we just had a um, justice, um, what was that called? The probation thing? Uh, justice reinvestment and the co-chair of it um, was somebody that was sentenced under um, felony murder law. Uh, my friend Kevin Reese, who's a rock star, along with a Republican um, legislator that is trying to reform our probation stuff here. And so we have a, I mean, we, we would, we would um, insert, insert ourselves into the process. You can be assured. Give a shout out to my colleague Madeline Nelson, who's the governor's director of uh, appointments uh, to boards and commissions, and is responsible for the, the appointments you just mentioned. So, um, it is it's a core value of, of our administration to make sure that the, the voices at the table are the, the folks who are affected by policy. And so, um, we spend a lot of time reviewing a lot of applications and reaching out to folks if we don't have the sorts of applications that we're looking for to make sure that um, uh, these sorts of boards and commissions have that representation on them. So memo to President Biden, it can be done. <laughs> Absolutely. Hi, so I have a question about how we can integrate into like having lawyers assist with clemency. I know Professor Osler and his clinic does a lot of it, but whether that's something that can be added into the legislation or 
so more people. I know Gina spoke about how it's very hard to prepare an application, but how can that uh, be increased because Mark Osler cannot address everyone in Minnesota? I, I mean, I, I'll just say a couple things. One is uh, you all as law students, and uh, when, you, when you start practicing, there's absolutely no reason why you can't take on pardon cases as paid work or a, a pro bono. Uh, and we're seeing more and more of that. Um, and we've actually got a couple of great lawyers in the criminal defense bar who are sort of marketing pardons as part of their practice now, which I think is a relatively new thing. And, uh, and they're, getting, they're doing terrific work and getting terrific results for their clients. Um, and, uh, and I would say the value of a lawyer is, to, to me at least, as uh, somebody observing this process, is really on the front end. It's helping that person prepare their application, um, review their criminal history, uh, explain it, you know, set out a narrative, uh, and prepare them, talk with them before going into the hearing to speak for themselves. Um, lawyers play less of a role in the hearing itself, and I think that that's a really important part of the process is that the board wants to hear directly from the applicant. Um, but uh, I would say there's plenty of room for lawyers to get involved and, um, and do this important work and help prepare clients, uh, both uh, on the paid side and, and, and the pro bono side. Um, it's been a, it's something that I think uh, our office has thought about and we've, we've thought about, we, we've had, we have good connections now with all three of the local law schools. Um, I think um, expanding the, the network to law firms and, and seeing whether firms be willing to take this work on pro bono is something that I'm excited about talking to folks with. And, um, and so, so that's, that's my perspective. So there's room for lawyers. It's a, it's a, uh, a really great way to invest and, and get a result and frankly also just to appear in front of the Chief Justice, the AG and the, the Governor, like how many opportunities do you get to do that as a lawyer? It's just a really unique thing. So, um, so that's my perspective as, you know, somebody who's advising a board member, but I don't know. Are you taking s state pardons now, your clinic? Um, only informally, so we'll put a pin in that one for now. Okay. Yeah, um, because uh, you're right, I can't hug every cat. Um, <laughs> that, and it's, but, but there's definitely that, that need. And, and we have had um, St. Thomas students are among the people who have been taking up these cases, both pro bono and as part of their practice. And, and that's something that I think we'll see continue to So happen. additionally, we have a legal clinic at Minnesota Adult and Teen Challenge. We have about 700 residential clients that have legal needs. And so if there's anybody interested, um, you can come talk to me. We have an in-house lawyer that kind of navigates all of that. Um, it's more than just pardons, obviously, but just shout out for that if anybody's interested. That's, that's great. Do we have time for one more question, Madison? Anyone have a question? No. Yes, <laughs> is the answer. That is, it's very strange. Um, there's some other states that have, uh, you know, state officials that are on a board. Nebraska is the one that's closest to us. And then you've got states like Delaware. And what's interesting is Delaware, they have all these minor people, like the state auditor is on the board of clemency. Um, and I think Delaware or Maryland uh, is, is similar in that way. So uh, we've got different structures, but ours is, is very strange. And one of the problems, of course, is that, um, you know, the Supreme Court has very often heard these cases um, on direct appeal. And so they're, you know, to have both affirming a conviction and then having a role in looking at mercy, um, there probably is a conflict there. So, uh, and I, I, can I ha have one more question here, Miss, and then we'll take a break. But I'm just wondering for all of you, what is it that gives you hope at this point? I mean, for me, it, I mean, all the work that I do. Um, we worked on sentencing guidelines. We worked on the pardon board reform. I work on family reunification stuff. And for this pardon stuff, like, I'm good, right? I'm good now. And my hope is always that we can make it 
better, smoother for the folks coming behind me. And so that's always my hope. Uh, two things. One is I get to uh, work with uh, the fine folks up here on really important issues. And, uh, um, you know, I think that we are making a difference in terms of telling, telling the story and getting uh, more visibility and more focus on this. Uh, and then the second is that sometimes you win. <laughs> and so uh, last session we, uh, we had a really big win on uh, reforming our probation uh, system that I, I mentioned putting the, the five-year cap on through the Sentencing Guidelines Commission. Uh, I don't think that would have happened, but for the efforts that were coming from the outside and the efforts that we were doing at the legislature. So, um, you know, sometimes you can make really big changes. I, I mean, I'm staring at this slide. So this slide gives me hope, right? Like we, we, we haven't changed the law yet. We haven't, um, you know, changed the system and just through, through additional applications and, and getting the word out and, and pushing on a lot of different fronts, we've been able to bend the curve a little bit. Uh, and I'd also say like this symposium gives me hope. Like you all are, I, when I was in law school, I didn't know about pardons and I, you know, I, when I was in practice, I, my, my pro bono work didn't involve this sort of work at all. And I encourage folks in this room to think about whether there are opportunities as a law student or a lawyer to um, take on one of these cases if, you know, a handful of cases can make um, just a giant difference in each individual life and uh, that's incredibly gratifying as an advocate and a lawyer and uh, and it's it's a really uh, gratifying and fun part of my job um, that I didn't even know I was walking into. I'm glad you have at least one fun part of your job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I always forget you told me I can say whatever I want I always forget uh -oh. that <laughs> um, and as a person of faith like um, all that I said and you know the hope in that for me is like that I get to do all that work and then through my faith and um, and let and like my walk and the work that I do for other people that in the midst of that somebody asks me what's why why I'm different what's different about me and that I get to share my faith somewhere in the middle of that so yeah. and the same happens to me and that's a happy moment <laughs> so um, <laughs> All right, so we have a break until 10, 15? Yes, 15 minutes. Thank you, everyone, for your engagement. Yeah. Continue to ask and, questions. And let's thank the panel for their amazing work. All right, hello, everyone. Um, thank you all for coming back. Uh, thank you for engaging today. My name is Sean Smallwood, and I am the incoming editor-in-chief for the St. Thomas Law Journal, um, and I'm super excited to be here. I also want to give a quick shout out to Robert for printing off the bios for me because I can't see things on my phone sometimes. So this is going to make our program go a little bit smoother. Um, so I'm going to introduce our panelists and then I'm going to hand it over to Professor Osler um, to lead us through this second set of panel. Um, the first person is Sarah Carlson, um, which on here it says ADCTCPRSR Assessor, um, all important acronyms I'm sure. And they work with the Minnesota Adult and Teen Challenge. And Sarah Carlson um, struggled with 20 years of addiction to drugs and alcohol that led to homelessness and criminal activity. In 2010, Sarah was arrested and later indicted along with 22 others in Arkansas for drug charges that resulted in her receiving a felony. In 2011, Sarah entered a 13-month faith-based residential treatment program at the Minnesota Adult and Teen Challenge. After graduating from the program, she went on to work at Minnesota Adult and Teen Challenge as well, and now has 10 years of experience working in the field of addiction. Sarah has worked as a recovery coach, a peer recovery support specialist, a client manager, staff supervisor, and is currently working as an addiction counselor in admissions. Sarah has been working with Mark Osler since 2020 in hopes of receiving clemency. I said this was going to go smoothly, and then I messed up the order of my papers. Um, next, we have Paul J. Larkin, Jr., who is a part of the John, Barbara, and Victoria Rumpel Senior Legal Research Fellow at the Heritage Foundation's Edwin Meese Center for Legal and Judicial Studies. Um, Paul works with, on criminal justice policy, drug policy, and regulatory policy. Before joining Heritage in September 2011, Paul had or held various positions with the federal government and the private sector, 
Um, for example, Paul served as the assistant to the Solicitor General at the U.S. Department of Justice from 1984 to 1993. He was also assistant general counsel at Verizon Communications from 2004 to 2009 when Bill Barr was the general counsel. Paul received his law degree from Stanford Law School. He received a master's degree in public policy from George Washington University, and he holds a Bachelor of Arts degree in philosophy from Washington and Lee University. Paul has also published numerous articles on different aspects of clemency, and you can see these in the bio, but notably I'll point out um, the one published in 2020, The Future of Presidential Clemency Decision-Making, which was published by our journal in 2020, so make sure that you check that one out. Um, and that is Paul J. Larkin, Jr. And then finally on our panel, I'd like to introduce Cynthia Roseberry, who's the Deputy Director of Policy, National Policy Advocacy Department Head, IPEM Law Academy at the American Civil Liberties Union. Um, at the National ACLU, Ms. Roseberry works to reform criminal justice system, focusing on issues like policing, bail reform, clemency, the death penalty, and other criminal justice related matters. Her work supports ACLU's affiliates across the nation. During the Obama administration, she served as executive director of the historic Clemency Project 2014. Often referred to as the nation's largest law firm of nearly 4,000 lawyers, it provided pro bono support to obtain release for nearly 2,000 people. Ms. Roseberry was cited in the Merriam-Webster Dictionary when the word decarceration was entered. Ms. Roseberry has also served on the Charles Colson Task Force on Federal Corrections, a nine-member bipartisan congressional blue ribbon panel charged with examining the federal correction system. The task force released its groundbreaking report, Transforming Prisons, Restoring Lives, final recommendations on the Charles Colson Task Force on Federal Corrections in January of 2016. Previously, Ms. Roseberry was the executive director of the Federal Defenders of the Middle District of Georgia. She taught advanced criminal procedure and co-taught in the death penalty clinic at DePaul University College of Law in Chicago, where she also founded the misdemeanor clinic. For more than 10 years prior to teaching, she practiced federal and state criminal defense in Georgia. A founding member of the Georgia Innocence Project, she was the first African-American female president of the Georgia Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers. She received the 2016 COS Humanitarian Award, the 2017 Annual Service Award from the Alpha Alpha Chapter of Phi Beta Sigma Fraternity, Incorporated, and the 2017 Champion of Justice Award from the National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers. Ms. Roseberry earned her Bachelor's of Science from Wilberforce University in Ohio. She earned her Juris Doctor from Georgia State University College of Law. A national and international speaker, Ms. Roseberry has presented in nearly every U.S. state in Europe and the former Soviet Union and to a delegation of judges from China. Her TEDx talk, My Father, My Hero, delivered from inside a prison, has been critically acclaimed, which you can see in our digital program guide, and you can look at that after today's program. Um, and so that's our panelists, and I will now turn it over to Professor Osler, who got a marvelous introduction from Robert, so I don't necessarily feel the need to say much more than that, so thank you. All right, thank you everybody for coming back. Um, and I would add to the introductions um, that were just given that these people are awesome. Uh, I've had the pleasure of working with, with each of them for, for years. And, uh, and I, I, because of that and how much trust I have in each of them, I've given them broad leeway on what they're going to discuss. Whereas the, the first presentation was, was relatively linear, I think that here we're going to hear different perspectives. And, and because of that, I wanted, before we get going, just give a little thumbnail sketch of, of the federal system and, and how it works. That historically, presidents gave dozens or hundreds of uh, grants of clemency a year. And we saw that drop off precipitously about 30 years ago. Um, one reason that probably happened is because of a broken process, that uh, it became more bureaucratic over time. And then that bureaucracy tends to protect itself. It's largely enmeshed within the Department of Justice. There's seven sequential levels of review that a uh, petitioner like Sarah um, is <laughs> throwing their petition into this gauntlet, where first it's going to be sent to a staff member at the pardon attorney's office, and they're going to get the opinion of the local uh, prosecutor who originally prosecuted the case, and that opinion is then given substantial weight. 
And then it goes to the pardon attorney. Then it goes to a staffer at the deputy attorney general's office. Then to the deputy attorney general. Then to an assistant at the White House counsel's office. Then to the White House counsel. And then, maybe, almost never, to the president. Um, right now, uh, we have almost no movement. President Biden, in the past 13 months, has not only not granted any clemency, he hasn't even denied any. It's basically been a, a ignoring of the entire process from what we can see, which is consistent with, with some things we've seen in other areas of criminal law. For example, the failure to appoint even a single member of the Sentencing Commission in those same 13 months. Um, we're going to start with uh, Paul Larkin, Jr. And Mr. Larkin, let's hear it. Thank you. I had an aunt that one of her favorite sayings was, position in life is everything. And so following her lead, I'm going to sit here rather than stand over there. It's a whole lot more comfortable than standing up. I think my colleague is going to wind up doing the same thing. At the outset, let me thank the fellow who introduced us and read the very nice introductions. Most importantly, however, let me thank Professor Osler for inviting me to participate here today and to talk to you. And more important even, thank you for coming. You have a lot of things that compete for your time. And I appreciate, as I'm sure my panel members do too, as well as the people who spoke earlier, that you took time out of your day to listen to us talk about an issue that may occupy only a small corner of the law, but occupies for some people virtually the entirety of their life. It's important to know about this area because it is important to see people devote themselves, not only to bettering themselves, but helping the lives of others. And so I want to thank you personally for everyone who's here today. Now let me tell you what I'm going to talk about. I am principally going to talk about an aspect of clemency that you rarely see discussed in the literature and that you haven't heard so far this morning and I don't think you're going to hear when I finish. And that's not about the procedure involved in the clemency process. It's not about the architecture of the clemency process, both of which, as Professor Osler has mentioned, have grown considerably uh, since the days when someone could write to Abraham Lincoln, he would read the letter that that person wrote, whether it was an applicant or the applicant's mother, and then actually do something himself immediately at that point. We now do have a rather bureaucratic system. And so the procedure and the architecture seem to occupy most of the discussion. But for me, I want to talk about something different. What I want to talk about is what the president should do when that file lands on his or her desk. Because you don't see that happen very much. In Article Two of the Constitution, it grants the president the power to grant reprieves and pardons. And that's it. And the Minnesota State Constitution isn't a whole lot different. I have it right here. It says, I'm quoting, the governor, the attorney general, and the chief justice of the Supreme Court constitute a board of pardons. Its powers and duties shall be defined and regulated by law. The governor, in conjunction with the board of pardons, has power to grant reprieves and pardons after conviction for an offense against the state, except in cases of impeachment. To me, what is singularly interesting about this part of the Constitution is it says absolutely nothing about how the governor or the other two people on this board should go about deciding whether somebody is entitled to a pardon. The text of the U.S. Constitution is no different. If you look to the Supreme Court's decisions, the Supreme Court's decisions don't help. Most of them actually deal with the interaction between the Article I and II branches, as in instances where, particularly after the Civil War, Congress decided to limit uh, the president's ability to grant pardons uh, to people who fought in the rebellion. But that's it. Otherwise, they declare it a safety valve, which is true. Uh, and for most of our history, it was. But they don't say when a president should grant a pardon. In fact, they go out of their way to say it's not for the courts to do this. So the Supreme Court's cases really don't help. 
So where do you turn to? Do you turn to academic discussions? Do you turn to moral philosophy? Do you turn to literature, art, music, all the other areas of human endeavor where they talk about human faults and human redemption? You may even want to turn to the Bible in that regard. But the interesting thing is none of those really help a president or a governor decide what to do. In fact, they don't really move him from having to decide whether to make a gestalt judgment about the desirability or need for clemency in a particular case, or whether there is some series of factors that have to be considered. Now, in the federal system, uh, there is an office of the pardon attorney at the Justice Department, and the pardon attorney is supposed to be responsible for putting all the applications together, deciding whether they meet the criteria that they've adopted, deciding whether a further investigation to be done by the Federal Bureau of Investigation is necessary. Uh, all of that then making a recommendation, as Professor Osler said, to the deputy AG and then on from there. Uh, and the Office of the Pardon Attorney has a list of factors that they consider relevant. Well, which is nice. It's good to always have a list of factors that you de decide are relevant, but what they don't have is a set of necessary and sufficient factors nor do they have an ordinal relationship amongst those factors. So all they're doing is basically saying that we have you know, a, an equation with multiple parts. We're not going to tell you which ones you need to answer and which you can leave blank. And we're not going to tell you how important all these are. Just go figure it out. Uh, now, maybe that's because no president has ever done anything like this. Okay? We had the Monroe Doctrine. We had Woodrow Wilson's 14 points. We've never had a president that really said, this is how I think the president should look at clemency. And that's even in the case of somebody like William Howard Taft, who was our nation's 27th president and then our nation's 10th chief justice. He never said anything other than the framers created the clemency power on the assumption the president wouldn't abuse it and that the president should always act in the public interest. You know, those are nice nostrums, but they're, whole, they're not very helpful in deciding whether a particular John or Jane Doe should receive clemency. So, I have been interested in this issue for years, and over time I've thought about it, and I decided to do some thinking about how, if I were president, God forbid, uh, uh, I would look at this sort of problem. What I decided was, you need to separate pardons from commutations. You know the president can offer a commutation, and you know the governor can, although interestingly, if you actually read the text of your state constitution, like the text of the federal one, it doesn't talk about that. It talks about reprieves, which is just delaying a punishment, and a pardon, which is a complete exoneration. It has been implicit, however, that the president can grant commutations, and the U.S. Supreme Court has said that on several occasions. And from what I gather from talking to people, your state Supreme Court has done the same. So commutations are on the table. But you have to separate them because they're very different inquiries. In the case of pardons, what you need to do is follow a decision tree. In the case of commutations, what you need to do is make category by category judgments. So let's start with pardons. The classic question, and the first one you should ask at all times is, is the applicant innocent? Now, normally when you ask if somebody is innocent, you think about what in criminal law you learned as the actus reus of the offense. If someone was in Chicago when a bank was robbed in LA and there was no prior scheming, the person couldn't be responsible for bank robbery. That's the classic case of innocence. But it's not always that clear. Why? There are a variety of constitutional doctrines that have developed over time to try to enhance the integrity of the fact-finding process at trial. And in some cases, it can be dubious whether or not you trust how well they worked. For example, if a, the government relies heavily, if not exclusively, on the testimony of a jailhouse informant, that can raise a serious question as to whether or not this person actually committed the crime because jailhouse informants, not surprisingly, they're interested in either avoiding jail time or limiting the amount they have to serve, and as a result, they may, you know, I know, heaven forfend, fudge a little on what the facts are, okay? So the governor has to decide not only whether 
for example, somebody could not physically have done the actus reus or had the mens rea, he has to decide how much confidence or rather how much lack of confidence he is willing to put up with in the criminal justice system. And if that is a factor to consider, then you expand the notion of what's innocent beyond simply the person who could not have done the physical acts. Okay? But that's just the classic case of factual innocence. There are two other innocence categories. One is legal innocence. I mean, the classic instance there is where the statute under which someone was convicted is unconstitutional. Or, in the case of the federal system, this comes up regularly, whether the person was convicted under a then reigning theory of uh, interpret statutory interpretation that the Supreme Court has rejected. If you look at the Supreme Court's decisions dealing with white collar crimes over the course of the last three decades, they have in an enormous number of cases disagreed with the Justice Department on the proper interpretation of a statute. So if this person was convicted uh, in a particular circuit under a reigning theory of liability that the Supreme Court later rejected, that, that person is now factually innocent, if you will, but he can't challenge it on habeas corpus if he's completed his sentence and is not in custody. So that's uh, an additional case, not just where the statute on is unconstitutional, but where the highest court has changed the interpretation that was then prevailing in the lower federal courts for a particular criminal statute. But there's a third category of innocence too, that's moral innocence. The classic example of that is what uh, Reverend Martin Luther King wrote about in a letter from a Birmingham jail, a system where you may technically have violated the law, but the system as a whole is operating in an immoral fashion. But there's another example, and it comes up probably more in the federal system than in the uh, state systems, and that's where someone is convicted of a strict liability offense or perhaps of violating a regulation adopted by a federal agency to implement a statute. Strict liability offenses have been decried by a hall of fame of criminal justice commentators throughout the 20th century on and into the 21st because Historically, the criminal law had always distinguished between those who willfully violated moral codes, which then also appeared in the criminal codes, uh, and people who acted without knowing that what they were doing happened to cross the line between lawful and unlawful, in part because there was no intent requirement in the law. I think that's another category of innocence, where you're morally innocent. You haven't displayed a conscious disregard of the rules of society, both as set privately by the community and as set formally by the state through the legislature with the action of the governor and signing a bill into law. So I think, for example, a governor could just decide uh, or the president could just decide no one who is convicted of a strict liability crime should receive uh, a conviction on his record. Or later, I'll say that's another basis you could use for commuting it. But there are other factors that then consider, once you get past that, you want to ask, is this crime an act or an episode that was unique in this person's life? Or the other extreme, is this a professional hitman for one of the cartels or mobs? The very first case I argued in an appellate court was in the Sixth Circuit and it had dealt with someone a hitman who'd been convicted under what we used to call the funny gun statute. That is the statutes dealing with silencers, sawed off shotguns and the like. And he had made a career of doing this. Well, there's a big difference between someone who, you know, did something wrong when he or she was, was young or did multiple things wrong but in a defined finite period and someone who's made a career at a breaking bad. Those two categories are, should be treated very differently. The third question then is, has the person admitted his wrong or her wrongdoing, tried to make amends for the harms, both to the law and to the victims involved, and engaged in what is known as metanoia, had a complete change of heart as to all this. Someone who has done those has basically said, whatever person I was before is not who I am today. I agree with society that that is wrong. It should not be done. I regret I, 
doing it, and I am taking steps to make sure that everything that I did to hurt someone has, to the best extent of my ability, been undone. That would include even violent crimes. Those of you who you know, may recall, St. Paul was involved in the stoning of Thomas. Uh, no, Stephen, excuse me, Stephen. And as the result, he would have been in that category of someone who committed a violent crime. But he is the classic example of somebody in ancient time who had undergone metanoia. My example for today is Professor Sean Hopwood at the Georgetown Law Center. After high school, he was involved in armed robbery, several of them, in fact. He was convicted and sentenced to prison. And while there, he not only got a college education, he turned his life around. He wound up later graduating from law school, getting a clerkship with a conservative judge, Janice Rogers Brown on the DC circuit. He told me all the liberal judges he applied to turned him down. She took him as his law clerk. He is now on the faculty at the Georgetown Law Center and is working towards tenure, and I sure hope he gets it. He deserves a pardon on this ground. Finally, there are, if you're talking about the president rather than a governor, uh, there are instances where matters of state intrude. The president may need to grant a pardon to get somebody out of prison so that they can engage in a prisoner exchange with a foreign country. Back early in the 60s, Gary Powers was engaged in U-2 flights over the Soviet Union. He was shot down. He was being held by the then Soviet Union. We had a uh, colonel in the KGB who we had arrested, convicted, and imprisoned for espionage. And if you've ever seen the movie The Bridge of Spies, which is actually really good, I recommend movies. Uh, it's about that. Uh, we wound up making that trade. There are those circumstances that arise. That's collateral to the criminal justice system, but it can arise, and it also justifies, in those cases, a pardon. Okay, now turn to commutations. They are very different from pardons. When you're talking about a pardon, you're focusing on one offender and what he or she did. When you're talking about a commutation, you're talking about one offender, the sentence that he or she received, and how that sentence compares to all other sentences in this category. I mean, I clerked for a district court judge uh, right after law school, and uh, the pre-sentence report always had in there a discussion of what the other sentences were for this crime in that district, so that the judge would know, you know, essentially what the range was. This was in a pre-sentencing guidelines era. Uh, I handled every sentencing guidelines appeal that went through the Justice Department from November 1 of 87 when they went into effect through 93 when I left the office of the Solicitor General. And it, it's, it was a, you know, it's a very good system. It's controversial, I know. I thought it was particularly good because judges who never had a criminal practice didn't know essentially what a case was worth and the guidelines gave them a place to start. Now, I always thought uh, they would, after a while, be held uh, that they were required to be discretionary rather than mandatory, but that's another subject I'll be you know, glad to talk about if you're ever interested in a future occasion. But commutations, I think, have to be decided on a category by category basis. I think President then President Obama did the right thing when he had the clemency program 2014. I think he went about it the wrong way. What he should have done was the following. Congress had shortened the drug sentences, uh, but not made those changes retroactive when it passed the Fair Sentencing Act, okay? What he should have done is just issue a general amnesty, a broad commutation that limited every sentence that uh, was imposed for a violation of the controlled substances laws that was not affected by that act to what it would have been if it had been sentenced today and then leave it to district courts to decide what it was. Because the problem is, if the president is going to essentially engage in resentencing, one of two things has to be true. Either one, the president has to spend all his or her time going through the files and reading through what is involved in order for this to be legitimate. You don't want the president doing that, okay? I mean, you know, unlike the governor, the 
president actually has a foreign policy aspect of his position that he has to deal with. And for example, right now, it's probably occupying the majority of President Biden's day. So you don't want him to be spending all that time because you can't add to the 24 hours he has. And you don't want him to delegate it to others. Why? The framers gave the pardon power to the president because he is elected by a nation. And if the nation is going to forgive, it ought to be done by the one person who the entire nation elected. Not by an assistant U.S. attorney in the Western District of who cares what, all right? But that's what happened. He basically delegated the responsibility down to other sorts of levels. And as a result, anybody who knew how it worked, you know, you weren't getting the president's real decisions in this. So how do you do it on a category by category basis? Well, the easiest one, capital punishment. The president can decide, I don't want anybody to be executed during my term, and so I'm going to commute every sentence that comes up to life. And that can be life with or without parole. Uh, Congress tried to eliminate parole in the Sentencing Reform Act of 84. Actually, I think once the Supreme Court held that the, the sentencing guidelines were discretionary, parole came back into effect because Congress wanted the guidelines to be mandatory. But that's, like I said, like before, another subject. The next one is, I said, should there ever be life imprisonment or life without parole? If not, then figure out what the maximum term of years is. And figure out what the maximum term of years, third category, for different types of crimes, okay? The maximum term for drug trafficking may be different than fraud, may be different than trespass, and it may be different than all sorts of other offenses. So you set a maximum, and okay, no one should serve more than 20 years for drug trafficking. No one should serve more than five years for fraud, okay? You make that, and then it, you don't have to worry about going through and deciding, does this guy get 60 months or 55 months or 48 months? And then finally, are there some offenses as to which there is no justification for imprisonment? I mentioned that earlier when I was talking about uh, strict liability crimes. Now, there's a last issue that comes up that I, I won't spend a lot of time on now, but it, it deals with the problem of what's called suspension. Normally, when you talk about suspension of the law, you're talking about suspension of habeas corpus, because that's what the Constitution actually says. But the truth is, the president is not permitted to suspend the laws. Uh, it's not in Article 3, but the, but, excuse me, oh, Article 2. But Article 2 has the take care clause, and it's implicit in that if you know your history. Congress, excuse me, Parliament and the King had for a, quite some time been fighting over whether the King could just suspend laws that Parliament passed. And Parliament won in the Bill of Rights of 1868. Uh, Parliament put in provision saying, unless authorized by Parliament, the King cannot suspend the laws. And uh, William and Mary acceded to that up, upon you know, entering the throne. So there is a, a restriction. The President can't just refuse to enforce the immigration laws, for example. But the pardon clause deals with a smaller niche, and I don't think it applies in this case. It's the criminal justice system that even after Parliament had limited the, pre the uh, king's ability to act, they didn't really do the same uh, in the case of clemency. So there you have it. I think it's important to decide what is the decision-making process for a president or governor. I think you have to separate pardons from commutations and treat them differently. And I've laid out the different ways you have to do that. I just uh, hope that uh, somebody at some point will show an interest in this and start thinking it through because unfortunately, the way these decisions are made now is not always for the public benefit. Thank you. Well. Thank you, Paul. And I, I do want to note one thing about Sean Hopwood, too, who spoke here in 2019, is that uh, he had a pretty good end to the Trump White House. He, uh, while he was teaching, um, they asked him uh, at Georgetown, do you want a research assistant? And he said, sure. And he got Tiffany Trump. 
as his research assistant and ended up being called into the White House pretty regularly. And as I understand it, what he said was that he didn't want to be considered for a pardon because he thought it was more important that other people get consideration, which will no doubt um, only increase the esteem you probably have for Sean. Yes. Um, so now, Cynthia. So thank you um, to Dean Fisher for having me here, and thank you, Mark, Professor Osler, for inviting me. I think you're probably the only person who could get this Georgia woman to Minnesota <coughs> in March. Um, thank you for to the Law Review membership and leadership. I'll note that I was not on Law Review at Georgia State, so I feel this as a triumphant return to your, your midst. Um, it's a pleasure to be presenting here on this panel, uh, this discussion for um, the change of ideas all for the common good, as you would understand. And it's an honor to be here among these esteemed panelists. I have to admit that after I heard Paul speak, sort of felt like, I'm sorry, sort of felt like, you know how you leave an exam and, and someone says, what did you get to question six? And someone says, oh, I got seven. And you say, I got dog, right? <laughs> I feel like I got dog, right? <laughs> so my comments come through my experience uh, in this nation as an African-American person. Um, I filter my view of clemency through that experience. And so I offer these thoughts, um, you know, sort of from that personal space. I do note here that I'm the only chocolate person in the room, right? And so there's an there's a interesting feel to, to being that person and lifting up this particular perspective. I think normally when we think about clemency, we think about granting mercy and recognizing redemption for those who are convicted of crimes. I think that clemency is a, also a way for the nation to redeem itself. And so clemency should reflect an evolution in our views of the criminal legal system. Uh, the power was granted to avoid severity and unfortunate guilt. Otherwise, as Hamilton put it in Federalist Paper 24, justice would wear a countenance too sanguinary and cruel. It was intended to be both a check on and a separation from judicial power. And of course, impeachment is that check back on the power of pardon. And I note that Article 2, Section 2 tracks Hamilton's language uh, in granting the power. So the concept of clemency looked to preventing injustice caused by punishment that was too severe. And of course, Hamilton mentions in the general introductions to the Federalist Papers that the discussion is to establish a constitution that would focus on the security and preservation of, among other things, liberty. And so the irony of a descendant of Africans who were enslaved at the very moment the Constitution was penned, lifting the concept of liberty as the clarion call to establish the Constitution is not lost on me. In, in addition to the fact that the 13th Amendment uh, didn't abolish slavery in the context of the criminal legal system. But the power ne nevertheless is meant to be broad, as Hamilton wrote, the benign prerogative of pardoning she should be as little as possible fettered or embarrassed. And, you know, also these powers go back to the English prerogative of mercy of the king. So it has been used both on this case-by-case -case, uh, basis and in this categorical approach, I completely agree that the approach needs to be categorical. Uh, you saw during the last administration an extreme example of the case-by-case -case approach to clemency, I believe. And of course, during the Obama administration, we saw a categorical use of clemency, and chiefly in the way that I propose it should be used. Uh, one of the criterion of the clemency initiative was to establish uh, that a change in the law was such that the sentence at the current time would be lower than if it, you know, at the time it's being considered for clemency. And I believe the current administration, I agree with you, Paul, should use it for those folks on left, 
uh, left on death row. Uh, he has the dubious of distinction of being the first, the, I'm sorry, the last administration has the dubious distinction of being the first lame duck administration to execute uh, someone in more than a century. And especially in view of the use of the death penalty uh, to kill 13 people after a nearly two decade pause. And that was at a time when most of the states combined had executed fewer people. It also was a time when we saw the only Native American on the row executed uh, and two, of, two people who committed offenses as teenagers who were executed despite claims of mental illness. So a moratorium on the death penalty during the Obama administration didn't save those who were on the row because the next administration just came in and executed them. Uh, and that's a way that the clemency power could have been used to reflect an evolution in our thinking and our moral values in where we are today. We've seen it used by President Carter to grant uh, to most of those who evaded the draft as a way to heal the country after the Vietnam conflict. We saw Ford conditionally pardon thousands who deserted during the conflict and pardon without condition those who evaded as much as as many as 50,000 people I've read. And then of course, George Washington pardoned participants in the Whiskey Rebellion as a means to heal the country and move forward. He did, however, go on to pardon over Hamilton's, Hamilton's objection, people sentenced for treason. Um, so here is how and why I think it should be used categorically to reflect an evolution in thinking it in our criminal justice system. Traditionally, the system has been steeped in racism, right? From the false narrative of black on black crime, in the face of data that shows us that a majority of the crimes are, that are committed are interracial. The FBI reported in 2011 that 50% of murder victims were white while 40% were black. 52% of those who committed murders against black people were black. 45% of those who committed murders against white people were white, right? We commit crimes against people who look like us. And so the narrative of black on black crime is a unique and distinct narrative that, that's picked out, right? And lifted up as a part of this racist system. Many of you are too young to remember Willie Horton, an African-American who was furloughed and became the center of the 1988 presidential campaign. Uh, former Massachusetts Governor Mike Dukakis, uh, who had embraced rehabilitation as one of the pillars of our uh, criminal legal system, uh, was, was defeated. And I believe a part of that defeat can be attributed to the racial dog whistle, the invocation of Willie Horton, who committed crimes um, after that furlough. And then, you know, where we sit now, I have to bring to light and uplift the unbroken line from the origins of policing in America as a slave patrol created to capture and return African Americans to chattel slavery, to over policing in black and brown communities, since of course we are here uh, where the specter of Derek Chauvin publicly executed George Floyd in this very state. Uh, even more, police community, over police communities tend to have high crime areas because policing in these communities is existent, right? There's more policing, so there's more arrests, so there's more crime, right? In 2012, black people were 3.5 times more likely than whites to be killed by police when neither attacking nor possessing a weapon. And the infiltration of white nationalists into police departments is well documented. And so too is the school to prison pipeline where even schools in black and brown communities are over police. And of course, the courts have not been able to sort of rectify this racism in the system. Uh, we learned in McCleskey versus Kemp that there's a requirement to show deliberate intent uh, which in fact immunizes the criminal legal system from judicial scrutiny on the basis of racism. And we also know that this racism from policing hasn't 
uh, has it left the system when we look at who's incarcerated in our nation? Of course, America leads the world in incarceration, particularly the black community is over, overrepresented. We all know that a black boy born today is, has a one in three chance of incarceration, and that black men uh, who are in their 30s are one in 10 in their number in the prison or jail on any given day, despite comprising roughly only 13% of the population, black men are 34% of the prison population. So what does that say about us and how the power to grant pardon and commutation should be used? I say it, it calls us to either admit that America's criminal legal system is steeped in racism and must be redeemed or that we must admit that we believe black people are more criminal. If we come to terms with the racism and white supremacy of the criminal legal system, then clemency is a tool that can be used to begin this remedy, right, to begin. And I want to be clear, I'm not speaking in terms of, of reparation here, right? This is a redemption of America. And it, it, it might not be clear to, to you in this room, I recently had discussions um, after the Ahmaud Arbery case, many of you saw that case from Georgia, uh, four of the lawyers who tried that case, and I've been close friends for, for years, for decades. And so there was harm caused by some of the ways that folks were represented in that case, and it became clear that there were sort of blinders about the experience of African Americans in the country and what certain words mean and, and how we use those words. And so I think James Baldwin tells us best in the fire next time, in the letters to his nephews, you were born where you were born and face the future that you face because you were black and for no other reason. The limits of your ambition were thus expected to be set forever. You were born into a society which spelled out with brutal clarity, as in many ways as possible, that you were a worthless human being. You were not expected to aspire to excellence. You were expected to make peace with mediocrity. For those of you who are unfamiliar with Baldwin's Fire Next Time, you may be familiar with ta Coates, Between the World and Me, which was seen as sort of a continuation at least by T Toni Morrison, who said she'd been wondering who would fill the intellectual void that plagued her after Baldwin died. But both works were framed as letters to nephews and a signal to members of the African American community uh, what the plight was, how racism is so systemic in America and affects us all and the expectations that we should have around it. You know, I think about how uh, in my discussions after the Ahmaud Arbery case, we talked about how it is my duty, I think, to appear in white spaces. And I think in many instances, it is your privilege not to have to appear in black spaces. And what that means is that sometimes there's a disconnect between, between the feeling. And so when you, when you hear black people raise up and say, America is unequal and are uncruel. Maybe it doesn't come from having been steeped in black spaces. I think about um, Frederick Douglass when he was asked to speak about the 4th of July to the Anti-Slavery Society in Rochester, New York. And this was, you know, long after the Constitution, of course, came into being. And when he said, you know, what to the American slave is the 4th of July? I answer a day that reveals to him more than all other days in the year the gross injustice and cruelty to which he is the constant victim. To him your celebration is a sham, your boasted liberty and your unholy license, your national greatness swelling vanity. Your sounds of rejoicing are empty and heartless, your denunciation of tyrants, brass confronted, brass fronted impudence. Your shouts of liberty and equality, hollow mockery. Your prayers and hymns, your sermons and thanksgivings with all your religious parades and your solemnity are to him mere bombast, fraud, deception, impiety and hypocrisy, a thin veil to cover up crimes 
which would disgrace a nation of savages. It is not, there is not a nation on earth guilty of practices more shocking and bloody than are the people of the United States at this very hour. And it's amazing how that rings true here as we sit after we saw what happened to George Floyd, right? And it's not always so implicit there, right? We know that Nixon's aide, Ehrlichman, confessed that Nixon understood that he couldn't make it illegal to be poor or black in the United States, but he could criminalize it. And he could criminalize the communities by associating black people with drugs and then criminalizing drugs heavily. He could arrest black leaders, raid black homes, break up black movement meetings, and vilify black people on the evening news all the while knowing that he was lying. And so James Baldwin reminds us that if any white man in the world says, give me liberty or give me death, the entire world applauds. We see this right now uh, with Ukraine fighting for its liberty. But when a black man says exactly the same thing, word for word, he's judged as a criminal and treated like one. And everything possible is done to make an example of this bad nigga so that there won't be any more like him. And we know that this racism in our criminal legal system comes from every corner. I see the carceral system as sort of the hub in the wheel and the spokes are poverty. You see that in fines and fees and the loss of employment from incarceration. In employment, exclusion from employment because of criminal history, health, the cost of health care and resistance to Medicaid expansion, particularly in the South, which mirrors the resistance to expanding public education after Brown. And then in education itself, itself funding and access to, fun, to funding and test score uh, differences, all pillars of a successful community that have been eroded. So if the carceral system is the hub and all of these spokes come to the hub, and we know that racism permeates. You can, because you can see it in any vestiges. I thought about when I boarded my flight on the way here, you know, they call first class first, and then they call diamond and platinum and gold, and you know, I'm probably rock, right? <laughs> but if you look at the racial disparity in that, and think about how you get to be a diamond person, Probably people who have been employed in jobs that allow them to travel to gain those points, right? The vestiges just continue to show themselves every day. So although it's no panacea, clemency can be used as a first step in addressing the harms from the systemic racism in our carceral system. Uh, many people who sit in prison today convicted, for example, of marijuana distribution uh, sit there even as Congress prepares to examine the Safer Banking Act, which will allow people engaged in legal mar marijuana industry to use our banking systems. And that's before the MORE Act will get a floor vote, the MORE Act being uh, the uh, act introduced by Vice President Kamala Harris when she was a senator that would both uh, deschedule marijuana, decriminalize marijuana, but would also provide some social reformation, expungement to those who uh, received a marijuana conviction and SBA loans and the like so that people can get involved in the industry. These people still sit in prison despite the fact that, you know, sort of the folks who are legally allowed to be involved uh, have more power and have expanded power to do this. So categorical clemency, for example, for those convicted of marijuana distribution would be a good step in addressing the harms from the war on drugs, which we know was particularly aimed at black communities and was based on falsehoods. Uh, I also lift up that the abolition of the Federal Parole Board means that there are certain people sitting in the federal system who have no means of being released. These so-called old law prisoners were convicted before November of 87. There's about 150 of them, and they're among the oldest and most vulnerable people in prison. Surely now our moral compass guides us 
uh, to see them come home. Folks who were re released under the CARES Act during COVID, the beginning of COVID-19, who's performed well, who've reunited with their families, who've shown that they can be trusted in the community, right? Clemency for these folks can be a way to redeem ourselves and our nation uh, from the ills that we've caused. Mandatory minimums, as Paul suggested, is also a place where we can have clemency to reflect our, an evolution in our thinking and a, and a readjustment of our moral compass. And I'll just say that these mandatory minimums are triggered by criminal history. And if you think about the fact that criminal history is triggered by over-policing, we still get back to the origin of you know, racism in the system. Um, and despite the fact that politicians have their tough on crime rhetoric, and not here, <laughs> but across the nation, the ACLU has discovered that Together, we don't believe this anymore. We don't believe we need to be tough on crime. We believe we need to be smart on crime. We did a poll in 2020 and found that 62% of voters believe that we should reduce the prison population and that would strengthen communities by reuniting families and saving tax dollars that can be reinvested in the communities. And this is irrespective of political ideology. 85% of Democrats, 81% of independents, and 73% of Republicans support prison reduction through clemency. And a majority of voters nationally, um, there's a 63 to 33% margin that favor granting relief to those temporarily relieved, uh, released through COVID-19. So we have moved, our hearts have moved. And if we are to redeem our nation, then clemency is a tool that we must demand should be used to bring us into alignment with what our hearts and minds tell us is the moral thing to do to redeem our nation. I think I'll stop there. All right. Thank you. All right, thank you, Cynthia. And, and now we're going to turn to Sarah Carlson. And just by way of introduction, she's already been introduced, but I do want to say this, that that um, you know, doing the clinical work here for over a decade now, Sarah had the strongest petition. And it's not because of what we wrote, it's because of the life that she lived. Sarah. I just wanna first say thank you for um, allowing me to be here. I'm in a, I feel blessed to be in a room full of world changers. Um, and I'm not a public speaker, so a little grace. Um, just to start out a little bit of background, um, you know, I was born to a teenage mother, um, started using drugs and alcohol at 13. I started IV drug use at age 17, um, and that led to uh, the next 19 years of really destructive behavior, bad choices. Um, the last four years of my addiction um, I lost my children, I abandoned them, really, and they ended up going to the system in one way or another. Uh, I was homeless the last four years of my addiction, and the day that I received the, got arrested, uh, that resulted in this felony, I was staying at a friend's house because I didn't have anywhere else to go. He was leaving to go pick up um, five and a half ounces of methamphetamine. And he said, well, you can come with me or if you don't have anywhere to go. So I went with. It was a two hour drive, ended up falling asleep while he was inside doing what he had to do. We left on our way home uh, somewhere within the, that time frame because I was still sleeping. We got pulled over. Uh, in, the, in the front seat of his vehicle. He had multiple water bottles. He asked me to pour it into the bag. I did. Um, waited for it to dissolve, got rid of it. So when we were arrested, I did not, I asked for a lawyer. So they stopped asking me questions. I never saw a lawyer. Uh, they released us. Long story short, like, uh, we were just waiting. Another agency had picked it up and it turned federal. And I ended up, that was in Arkansas. I ended up 
in Minnesota and in Minnesota Adult and Teen Challenge. Um, six months into my stay there, I found out I was indicted with 22 other people with, in this indictment because it was linked to a 13 pounds that came across, came from Mexico. Um, in Teen Challenge, I was um, I was able to really process my trauma and um, unpack all of that, and I had an encounter with God. Um, I graduated that program. All this time, I'm still going, flying back and forth to Arkansas for this charge for court. Um, I ended up going into their ministry school, got hired, and, was, and I've been working there ever since. Uh, I, there was, I was looking at 26 to life, for these charges, um, but I was able to just admit my wrong. I told them how I destroyed evidence, and they gave me a couple downward departures, and the mandatory minimum was four years. I fully intended to go to prison. Um, when I flew there that day, you know, I just, um, I was so free inside from all of my trauma. I was all okay with going to jail. I was totally fine with it um, because I felt um, totally set free from everything. And the judge um, had his doctorate in theology and he was, you know, I just said, Lord, the Lord has delivered me from so much and he will deliver me from this too. But if he doesn't, it's okay because I can use this as a mission ground. Um, the judge threw out the mandatory minimum and gave me three years probation, which I was let go of early for good behavior. Um, since then, I filed to get my children back right after that, and I got custody of all of them back again. I uh, met my husband, who is a counselor at Teen Challenge. My oldest daughter went through the program and is also a counselor at Teen Challenge. I also am. Uh, I've restored my relationships with my family have all been restored because uh, they wouldn't, they weren't, allowed, they would not be around me because I was so toxic. Uh, you know, I've been in five different positions while at Teen Challenge. Um, each time, I've had to uh, reapply for a set aside uh, from DHS, and I'm very blessed that my um, Minnesota Don't Teen Challenge has you know, worked so hard for me. My HR company does it for me, so I, it's not a barrier that I've really had to struggle with, and I'm blessed because of them. Uh, you know, we had, couldn't rent. Um, I got a, one of the donors owned apartment buildings from Teen Challenge and allowed me the chance to live there, regardless of my felony. And we were not able to re-rent, luckily. You know, we were able to buy a home, but that wouldn't have been, that's not always an option for everybody. You know, so I've been really blessed in that. Um, what else can I say about that? You know, I, I guess I've just, I've worked really hard to be a better person. And I, every day I work with others that lost their children, are homeless, in addiction, you know, struggling with trauma. And I'm just really lucky that I get to do that every day. And there's, I don't know, I'm really emotional. Sorry, sorry guys. <laughs> All right, well, we've got a, a couple minutes left. Um, unless, Sarah, is there something more you want to? I'm good. Uh, okay, <laughs> well, thank you for that. Um, questions? Well, I'll, yeah, Gina. You did great, Sarah. Thank you. Thanks for being here. I'm gonna just a little bit open up this can of worms, Cynthia. Um, can you just speak a little bit to, um, so you talked a little bit about the way that the criminal legal system impacts um, uh, systemic racism, but can you just talk a little bit about the other systems that are also like the intersectionality between 
the medical system, child protection system, and kind of how, because you got into that a little bit with, you know, systems and over policing, but it, it's so much more than that. And I just would love to hear you talk about that a little bit. Yeah, sure. Thank you for that question, Gina. Well, you know, uh, no matter the term of incarceration in a felony sentence in America, it is a life sentence. Um, because you uh, can be excluded from housing, right, um, because of a conviction. You can be excluded from loans for education because of a conviction. You can be excluded, as you've taught me here, from having your children, right, because of a conviction. Um, you can be excluded from medical benefits in the federal medical system because of a conviction, right? You can be excluded, I mean, name a place where you can, where it does not impact your life, right? Would, would probably be uh, an easier ask because it's in every walk of life. In immigration, we saw that in the last panel. And I think we tend to think of the criminal legal system in that silo um, and, and we say, well, first of all, we don't, we don't say, oh, you served your time and you're redeemed and you're gone. We say, you get this time because we're angry with you. Not because we think it's going to help you or help society, because data shows that it doesn't. Um, but we don't think about how people walk after leaving those doors, because that scarlet letter F remains forever and impacts everything. In the federal system, if you're on supervised release, it is a violation of your supervised release to associate with someone who has a felony conviction. So are you supposed to interview all of your friends? And in certain communities, everybody has a felony conviction. And not only that, it's people with the convictions who, who've trod that path, who can help those coming behind, right, steer to a different place. And we foreclose those relationships. So it's, it, it, to me, um, the, the fact of that felony conviction creates an insurmountable obstacle to just redeeming yourself in life. It touches everything, rela from relationships to, you know, your financial well-being, to your health, to your education, your housing, everything, every piece of your life. Yeah, and just, just to follow up on that a little bit, that, um, you know, sometimes people say, well, pardons don't really matter so much. But, I mean, Gina, you talked about how much it matters. And, and Sarah, uh, the context of this is that her petition is pending. And it's been waiting for years already. Um, and there's 18, over 18,000 federal petitions pending while no action is being taken on them. And the cost is that all these problems that are compounded by that felony conviction for people who shouldn't be bearing it anymore are month, month, year, year, and just go on. And there is a real and direct cost to that. And, and I'll add another thing. I, I, uh, when I asked in the first panel if there had been some thought to putting people who are directly impacted, I learned that you guys are way ahead of the curve here on that. And so most people live under this shadow. Many people try to just move along without even having anybody know they have this impact because there's so much shame around it, right? So they don't come into the light about it. Other question? Sam. <laughs> <laughs> Courtroom voice. Yeah, that's a great question. <laughs> so I think about as we um, lobby on the Hill, who has the ear of our legislators? And it certainly is not people who don't have the right to vote and don't have the means to support a campaign, right? Uh, 
I said, Gina frowns when I say this, but there is a blessing in mass incarceration. Wait, wait, wait. That we've incarcerated so many people that it's on everybody's doorstep now, right? And it's, it's probably why the last administration granted any commutations because Jared Kushner's father had been to prison. So there's hope, right? But, but the coffers of those who, who, who um, would not have us change because of private prisons, because of electronic monitoring, I mean, there's profit in prisons. And those are the folks, sadly, who I believe have the attention of our lawmakers. Yeah, and, I, and I'd say that my experience has been that um, if I'm going to try to convince someone on this, uh, the problem isn't you're liberal or you're conservative. The problem is whether you care or not, whether you're timid or bold, whether you're acting out of fear or acting out of trying to make it better. Um, and that doesn't seem to correlate with, uh, you know, political party or anything else. I mean, when you looked at the, the chart that, that Carl had up here, you'll notice that the states that were up there are Alabama and, you know, I mean, Oklahoma, South, South Dakota, South Carolina. So this is not something where this is some progressive issue that's trying, trying to be shoved down the throats of conservatives or vice versa. It's something where people have different reasons to care about it. For some, it's racial equity. For some, it's a faith imperative. For some, it's a cost issue. Um, for some, it's a freedom issue for libertarians. So you, you do have this unique situation where it cuts across lines. And it's really apathy or timidity that's the common opponent. And I mean, right now, I'm so disappointed in President Biden for not having paid attention to this. Um, and as much as we've tried to, to put it on the agenda, it seems that they're able to successfully ignore it, and that's heartbreaking. When you have cases like Sarah's pending and sitting in a file somewhere. Paul. Can I, can I just say, I mean, part of the problem, I think, is there is difficulty getting bipartisan agreement on much of anything anymore. And that's because political scientists in the 60s and 70s got their wish. Back then, a lot of political scientists were arguing that they wished the American political system more closely resembled the British one. There was a liberal party and a conservative party. And over time, that's basically what we've gotten. The problem, however, is twofold. One, there is essentially only a unicameral legislature in Britain, whereas we have a bicameral one. So whatever the House of Commons votes on becomes the law. And they don't have a filibuster rule, which has been in effect for a long time because of the rationale that federal government should only impose its will on the entire nation if there is a consensus behind it. And you need 60 votes to represent the equivalent of a consensus. So what you, and what you used to have uh, thirdly, is liberals and conservatives in each party who could make deals across party lines. By virtue of the first factor, we really aren't seeing that anymore because it is seen that when either party agrees to something the other party wants, it's viewed as collaborating with the enemy. So I think there are some macro level explanations for what we're seeing here. Uh, that will probably work out over time. But right now, we're in the midst of the cauldron where you have two sides lined up like they were in the Great War, each one engaged in a battle against the other, and neither one is moving towards you know, uh, an advance. Uh, just a lot of casualties on each side and pretty much fixed lines. I think it will eventually wind up changing, but it, it, it's certainly not going to change any, any time in the near future, I think. I just want to respectfully amend that a little bit, because I think the two, the two parties are the rich and the poor. I see America very differently. Uh, you know, Congress can get together and, 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 and pass the Defense Authorization Act, right? 
you know, that, that multi-billion dollar package that benefits the elite in our nation. But I think poor people are largely left out of our system. And, you know, there's debate about whether the, the watering down of our education system created, a, you know, the masses so that we don't even understand what our system is. But I agree there are, there are two groups. Uh, I know I ain't in the ruling group. <laughs> and, and, and I believe that, you know, Gina and I were talking last night, I think that's why Martin Luther King was killed. He was beginning to pull together poor people across all races and having us see that united we are powerful and must cause our government to serve us. Uh, and that, you know, that campaign was derailed. I, I have to amend the am amendation. <laughs> it's good debate, right? <laughs> poor, poor people benefit from peace. And you get peace when nobody invades your country or orders you what to do. Just ask the people in the Ukraine. The United States, granted, has a geographic advantage over countries overseas that border Russia and China. But the benefit that a strong military provides goes to everyone of any race, any social group, any amount of income, any wealth status. And I think we deserve not only the people who have taken an oath to put their lives at risk to save Americans. I was at the Pentagon on 9-11, so trust me, I've seen what happens when people decide to take the law into their own hands. We deserve everybody in the country when we make it look like peace is not a gift to everyone. You get that only by doing the things that we do when we pass the defense budget. And we hurt that when we belittle the idea that no one benefits unless they get something physically, a dollar or more, a goodie or more, a widget or more. You get the right to live your life rather than being ordered by someone in a uniform from a foreign country when we protect the nation in that regard. And I think- As opposed to a police uniform, you mean? No, no. I'm talking about the ones that the, the Russians are wearing right now well, yeah. in, 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 at any rate, in we're, Ukraine. We're, uh, we're out of time, <laughs> and we fought, wandered pretty far away from clemency. Yeah. Um, and so I, I do want to end with this, um, just to try to pull it back to a, a place where we agree. Cynthia, uh, keep, uh, keep it in the DOJ or not? Oh, absolutely not. You, you know that. Yeah. Um, Paul? You, you establish an office of clemency in the executive office of the president. You don't tell DOJ they can't have a pardon office because any president is going to want to know what the Justice Department thinks about a pardon application. Even if the only reason the president wants to know is to avoid the risk that something goes very badly wrong and somebody asks the attorney general, what do you think? And the attorney general says, well, I would never have recommended in favor of this one. The president wants to know that up front. So yes, you, you got to leave DOJ as a party to the process, but you have to take away from DOJ the ability to strangle a clemency application in the cradle by moving it to the White House. You should have stuck with the hope question. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. Um, all right, well, first let's, let's thank our panel. And as we close, I very much want to thank Madison Fernandez for all the work she did to put this together.